Okay, this takes a little, um, a few moments to get everybody woven in. <clears throat> so we'll just give it a moment. Welcome folks who are joining. We're just gonna take a moment to get everybody woven into the meeting and then we'll, we'll kick, this morning, kick off this morning's meeting. <clears throat> I'm just watching as the numbers stabilize. Okay, I think we're almost there. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, and welcome this morning to the very first meeting of the Maine Offshore Wind Roadmap Advisory Committee. Um, we have here on the screen that you can see our members of the advisory committee and um, some key staff as well. Uh, we also have about 90 folks on um, joining us, uh, observing on this webinar. And thank you all for being with us today, um, you'll be in observer mode, uh, though we will have opportunities for comment uh, later. So you won't be able to unmute yourself, um, but we will be uh, having some time for public comment later. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick pass of the agenda and then turn it over to your co-chairs to kick us off. This is what we're gonna be doing today as a group. We're gonna spend three hours together. Um, we're gonna do some introductions and some welcome. Uh, since this is our very first meeting together. Uh, we're gonna talk about some essential context to our work in offshore wind. Um, and then we're gonna look at an overview of what this roadmap is and could be uh, in this 18 month process we're about to embark on. We'll take a break in the middle and come back and look at some of the sort of high level pieces of how we'll do our work, how we'll develop this roadmap with GEO, with the Governor's Energy Office. Um, we're going to make a space for some public input at the end of this meeting, and we'll finish up by noon. All right. So this meeting is all about sort of what's going on in the context, what's this roadmap, and how are we going to work together. Um, so that's how we're going to spend our time. To start, um, I'll turn it over to one of your two co-chairs, uh, Dan Burgess, who's director of the Governor's Energy Office. Um, and Dan, um, please go ahead. Take it away. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Burgess, Director of the Governor's Energy Office. Uh, really excited to be beginning this process and starting this process. And I'm grateful for uh, those of you uh, participating on the advisory committee, working groups, or just the general public that's here to here to participate. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, uh, to work on this Im important issue. So this is the first advisory committee meeting for the main offshore wind roadmap. Um, if you're here, you likely know that uh, this stems from a grant uh, that the Governor's Energy Office received of uh, $2.16 million for the, from the federal government, from the U.S. Economic Development Administration, particularly uh, uh, for developing a strategic plan for offshore wind in Maine. So this is the, the, the start of an 18-month process during which uh, the advisory committee, supported by uh, four working groups, technical consultants and uh, with input from the general public will help identify key issues and recommendations and ultimately come up uh, with a final roadmap. Um, so this advisory committee, uh, we're again, very pleased by uh, those that are, uh, are participating, represents a, a broad cross section of interests and expertise uh, uh, relevant to Maine offshore wind. And you really are essential to making this process work for Maine. So. Excited to be uh, beginning this process, this, this journey, and are um, really grateful for everyone uh, participating. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to David to, uh, to begin um, with introductions. Excellent, thanks, Dan. Um, so we're here today, um, and I think it's important that we sort of, not all of you know each other, uh, and so we do need to do a round of introductions. This is, where being virtual is most frustrating, but let's try to do this anyway. Um, I will note that uh, today we're here, myself from the Consensus Building Institute, my colleague, Laura Singer is here as well. Um, she will be co-facilitating 
um, with me, uh, the, these advisory committee meetings and this overall process. She is a crucial figure in this story. Uh, so Laura is here and my colleague Maggie Ostus is here as well from CBI. And she, if you have any tech concerns or issues, uh, text her in the Zoom, she can help sort those out. Okay, so let's do a quick round of all of us and uh, um, of advisory committee members and other folks who are here, because there's key staff here as well that's important that introduce each other. But I think um, the, the question that, uh, in addition to saying your name and your affiliations that I think are relevant for our work today, um, I, I'd like to ask the question of, you know, what motivated you to accept this invitation to participate in this committee? Uh, and I think that's, let's not spend more than a minute each on this or else we can spend the entire, entire morning. But if you spent 30 seconds or a minute answering that question of, you know, what motivated you to say yes, when either Dan or somebody else contacted you, let's do that. And I'm going to ask Dan's co-chair, um, uh, who goes by, who is an admiral, uh, and I'll allow you to say how you'd like folks to call you, uh, but uh, Admiral Gregory Johnson to kick us off with those uh, introductions. So Admiral, please go ahead. Thank you very much, David. My name is Brock Johnson and uh, I'm a Mainer. I was born in Aroostook County, took a 36 year sabbatical in the Navy and now I'm back here in Maine. Just as, as, as in uh, our national security depends on the strength of our economy, the same for the future common good of the state of Maine and for the well-being of all citizens depends on the strength of our economy. And it's become clear to me that this uh, opportunity that we have in the Gulf of Maine, both for our own renewable energy uh, goals and aspirations, but also to become a hub uh, for all of the Northeast uh, that is eventually going to take advantage of the incredible resource that we have in the Gulf of Maine. And I think that this presents an incredible opportunity economically and for our uh, uh, renewable energy goals. And I'm um, considered a real privilege to be able to work with Dan and the governor's energy office on this particular project. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. And I'm just gonna go quick around my screen without any particular order here. Uh, and so <clears throat> um, I'll start with Tom uh, Welch. Why don't you go ahead, Tom? Good morning, thanks. Um, I was uh, chairman of the PUC for about 15 years. Um, my particular interest here is that, uh, following up on the Admiral's uh, comment, I think the offshore wind resource is, is one of the things that Maine has that the rest of the world might want to buy, which is always a key economic question for a state. Um, and my particular interest is that there are a lot of energy market, energy infrastructure issues that are important to resolve in order to bring that resource uh, into play in a, in a useful way. And I think um, I have some interest in contributing to that process. Thanks, Tom. Um, Selena Cunningham, please go ahead. Good morning, Selena Cunningham, Deputy Director in the Governor's Energy Office. I am uh, motivated to work on the, the roadmap effort because it brings the opportunity to bring different sectors and voices that all have usually are, are in their own kind of um, areas of focus. And this really brings people together. And so I'm looking forward to having data and analysis to support um, our engagement and our work together to advance the industry. Thanks, Selena. That's great. Steve, go ahead, please. Um, I'm uh, Steve Von Vogt. I'm uh, president of Maine Marine Composites. We're an ocean engineering firm on the waterfront. I also, like many Mainers, have lots of jobs. I manage the Maine Composite Alliance, which is a nonprofit focused on composites. Uh, I've been involved in offshore wind and alternative energy in the ocean for about 15 years now. My company has worked on a number of projects around the world. My main interest in this is promoting the superb supply chain that we have here in Maine. We have many companies from uh, uh, Chimbro to uh, 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 Flotation Technologies, uh, all, Stantec that are engaged in offshore wind. They, they're engaged in it all over the world. And I think that we have a unique resource here in Maine in terms of the quality of our supply chain and our experience in working on the water. And I, I know you're gonna hear from a lot of interested folks who have a lot of experience in that space. So I'm in favor of uh, our supply chain and exporting it to the world. Thanks, Steve. That's great. Don, go ahead, please. 
Thank you, David, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, my name is Don Perkins. I serve as um, President and CEO of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, where I've been for the last 26 years. Um, and uh, what motivated me to uh, in, uh, say yes is that I, I, I served on the governor's uh, ocean energy task force, I guess it was, in 2010. And uh, we got, um, we kind of set the stage then for ocean wind and unfortunately it got politicized and, and uh, kind of exploded. Uh, and I, I think the conflicts that we've all been seeing are, are resolvable. Um, and once you get everybody in one room, figuratively speaking, to sort out the details. So I look forward to working with everybody. Thanks, Don. Neil, go ahead, please. Hey there, my name is uh, Neil Goldberg. I'm a legislative analyst and advocate at Maine Municipal Association. Happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, I am motivated to participate uh, and, and work with everyone uh, to represent our diverse members. Maine towns and cities um, have a diverse set of interests and we at MMA see a lot of potential um, outcomes that would support all of them, um, whether it be supply chain or coastal needs. And so happy to help with that. Thanks, Neil. Excellent. Terry, go ahead, please. I am Terry Alexander. Uh, I'm from Cundis Harbor, Maine. Um, I am a New England, uh, retiring New England Fisheries Council member. Uh, I've been on the council for nine years. I've done my three three-year terms and I term out. Uh, I've been on the Habitat Committee for the council since day one. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of experience with uh, habitat issues and uh, I'm a commercial fisherman, of course, and I've got 40 plus years experience fishing in those proposed wind, wind areas. And hopefully I can bring something to the table and I'm motivated because if you're on at the table, you're on the menu. So that's that's why I'm motivated. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Will, go ahead, please. Hi, everybody. Will Sedlak for Maine Conservation Voters. Uh, I mean, I guess the, the top level is when you're asked to serve, you serve. But for me, the you know, this is a way for us to uh, solve the climate crisis and, and for Maine to do its part. And I'm excited to be at the table so we can figure out a way that works best for Maine, Maine people. Thanks, Will. James Gilway, good morning. Good morning, I'm James Gilway. I'm the town manager for the town of Searsport, one of Maine's three ports in the three port system. And I think the world evolves around Searsport. So uh, being here at the table to try to help people, everyone in, in our group re recognize that. But in, in all seriousness, we have, uh, we have a perfect storm of of availability. We have the, the railroad, which is now uh, a class one uh, railroad across the country. We have the port, we have deep water, we, we have a lot of resources. We have a great wealth of, of uh, potential employees stretching from Rockland to Ellsworth to Bangor. And um, it's just a, it's a good time to be uh, thinking about the future. And, and I'm glad that Sears Port's at the table to uh, take part in it. Thanks, James. John Perry, um, if you're there, I welcome uh, introduction. I don't see your camera, but maybe you're on the road. And if you're on the phone, star six, star six allows you to unmute. Thank you, thank you, David. My apologies for no video. I've been struggling with uh, audio video issues with my computer the last few days. But uh, my name is John Perry. I'm the environmental review coordinator with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. I've been in that role for the past eight years now, I think, but um, I have about 20 or so years reviewing environmental impacts for onshore projects. Um, I guess I've been fortunate enough to be part of a team at IFNW that has been reviewing onshore wind since I've been there. And um, I'm really excited to hopefully bring that experience and apply it to, to this opportunity here for offshore wind. Thank you. Thanks, John. Meredith, go ahead, please. 
Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Mendelson. I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Marine Resources. Um, we've been working with the Governor's Energy Office on the development of the Research Array proposal. Um, and I've been following offshore wind development in Southern New England and how it's impacting fisheries and fishing activity down in, in that region. I am motivated to participate in this because I think we have an opportunity to try to do things uh, a little better up here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and I think this is a meaningful chance for us to bring together a group of people who can think about what we need to do to accomplish that. Great. Thanks, Meredith. Um, up next is Grant. And Grant, just a reminder of uh, the question that I posed at the beginning was what motivated you to say yes to this invitation? Um, so I'll just reiterate that, that question. Um, Grant, go ahead, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Grant Provost. I'm the business agent for Iron Workers Local 7 in the state of Maine. I'm also an AFL CIO executive board member. I serve on four other boards for the state of Maine as far as construction wage and uh, workforce boards are concerned. Um, I was in the trade. I was an iron worker, journeyman iron worker for 18 years before I took this job on. And uh, I found myself on projects that I really didn't believe in wholeheartedly. I didn't feel like they were actually making the world a greener place and trying to decarbonize the massive footprint that humanity has left on this planet. So when the opportunity to get onto this board arose, I was very excited. I see it as a way um, not, not only Mainers can move forward and become a hub in the world for offshore wind, but uh, a way to lead my organization in a direction that has a future that would lead to good paying jobs, careers for uh, local Mainers. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Grant. Jeremy, go ahead, please. Morning, uh, I'm Jeremy Payne, Executive Director of the Maine Renewable Energy Association. Um, for me, offshore wind uh, could be economically transformative for the state, as long as we get it right. Um, so I'm glad to be involved, to offer a perspective to help shape the future of this industry, uh, hopefully for the benefit of all Mainers. Thank Thanks, Jeremy. Ben, go ahead, please. Sure. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, David. I'm Ben Gilman. I'm general counsel for the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Maine State Chamber of Commerce represents a network of 5,000 businesses here in the state of Maine. And similar to Germany and others, we're really excited uh, for the economic opportunity that this poses for the state of Maine and excited to be at the table with everyone for this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Suzanne McDonald, go ahead, please. Hi hey everyone, good morning. I'm Suzanne McDonald. I'm the Chief Community Development Officer at the Island Institute and I live in Rockland. Um, my work, I focus um, on all, all of our economic and climate resilience programming and offshore wind has been something I've been working on um, literally since day one of my job at the Island Institute. Um, I've had the chance to work very deeply with the community of Monhegan in particular on this topic for many, many years. And also um, to what Meredith said, to learn from other states as well. We've worked very closely with folks on Block Island and the Vineyard in Nantucket. And I think there's a lot we can learn and improve on. Um, my hope is that I can be here to help be a bridge between community and the, the clean energy industry is a place where I have a lot of depth in in both areas and um, maybe help with some translation. And I'll just also add um, increasingly part of that work that I do in trying to bridge is to bring a focus on equity, which I know will be a topic here and asking the questions of who's here, who's included in the process, who's valued in the process and who's ben benefiting from all of this. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Suzanne. Wing, go ahead, please. Yes, hello, uh, Wing Goodale with Biodiversity Research Institute. I'm the Senior Science Director, and I've been thinking about and studying offshore wind and wildlife since around 2010, and I'm really excited to be a part of this group and be part of the discussion about how can Maine best um, consider offshore wind and, and environmentally responsible offshore wind as we move forward, and just really excited to be a part of this conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks, Wing. Jonathan. Poole, go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Jonathan Poole. I'm the large business development manager for the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, and I'm motivated to join this effort because uh, I grew up on the water. I sailed the world as a Naval officer, not as long as Admiral Johnson, but uh, I sailed the world as a Naval officer. Um, and so I believe in the, the economic opportunity afforded by both the marine sector and the renewable energy sector. Uh, I think it can bring a lot of, uh, 
economic opportunity to all main communities, both on the coast and inland as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Habib, go ahead, please. Good morning, Habib Dagger, University of Maine. I'm the director of the Composite Center at the university. Uh, the center is the largest university-based research center in the state of Maine with about 260 employees. Um, I started working on floating offshore wind for about 14 years ago. And, um, and uh, how would I not want to come back for a reunion uh, 12 years later, looking at the, at the, uh, the people I've, I see around this room, they're all friends and, and many are friends and many have served on the, on the prior task force 12 years ago. I look forward to all work with all of you again to make this happen. Uh, we were able to uh, support this committee with engineering support, technology support, uh, to make sure that uh, the jobs stay in Maine, uh, to make sure that we, uh, uh, we make a dent in the climate crisis that we have, and to make sure that we don't have another energy crisis in the state of Maine. If I recall correctly, uh, the advisory committee a number of years ago, 12 years ago, was created because we had an energy crisis in the state and, they, and uh, energy costs, fuel costs were $4 a gallon. Uh, a lot of communities in Maine were, were going to empty out because there was not, they couldn't afford to heat their homes and, and so forth. Um, so uh, I'm here to make sure that this, this another crisis like this doesn't happen in the state of Maine as well. Looking forward to work with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Habib. Great to have you here. Matt Burns, go ahead, please. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Burns. I'm with the Maine Department of Transportation. I'm the Director of Ports and Marine Transportation, and I'm also uh, with the Maine Port Authority as well. And uh, I'm, I'm passionate to be here uh, because I see offshore wind in this emerging uh, industry as, as being a tremendous port development opportunity for, for our main ports. So um, that's, that's where I come into it. And uh, I've been working on uh, uh, the a feasibility study that's been ongoing in Searsport, as well as looking at uh, several several other locations up and down the main coastline for potential port assets for offshore wind. So thanks, uh, thanks for letting me be here and uh, excited to be a part of the group. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, Matt Marks, go ahead, please. Hey, thank you, David. Appreciate it. Uh, Matt Marks, I'm with uh, Associate General Contractors in Maine, and our folks are the commercial contractors who uh, perform work in heavy highway and industrial and energy across the state of Maine. Uh, we've been involved in renewable energy work uh, during my time, I've been there 13 years, and before that I was also in the construction and energy uh, private sector business uh, before I entered AGC. So happy to be here, happy to see this advance and like to see may, more main based renewable happen here in our, in our borders. Thanks, Matt. Great. Patrice, go ahead, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, trying to get my video on. There we go. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Patrice McCarran. I am the executive director of the Maine Lobstermen's Association. I've been with the lobster industry for about 21 years. So a lot of experience representing fisheries interests and lobstermen in particular. Um, I'm here um, to be honest as a skeptic to this process. Um, obviously, if you're alive and breathing and read any news, um, you know that the fishing industry has many, many concerns. Um, I've been a huge advocate for the roadmap process out of the gate and very concerned about the pace of the state moving forward with the research array. So um, I wouldn't say that my participation came easily. It was a pretty intense discussion with uh, MLA board leadership. But in the end, like Terry said, <laughs> if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I I really hope that we can address a lot of the unanswered pressing questions about, you know, what jobs are we going to sacrifice, what jobs are we going to gain, the ecological impacts, the environmental impacts, how to cope with the industrial scale of this technology when people at sea actually need to work around it and make a living. So uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Patrice. Glad you're here. Um, I think we have Hannah Pingree on the phone as well. Hannah, are you there? Hey everyone, David, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, driving to Augusta, the legislature continues its work. So sorry to be on the phone for the beginning. Uh, Hannah Pingree, Director of the Governor's Inter um, Office of Policy, Innovation in the Future, uh, also co-chair of the Maine Climate Council. 
great to have many folks here who are also part of the Climate Council process, so obviously supporting Dan uh, Burgess and the Governor's Energy Office goals. Those are a crucial part of our climate plan, uh, but I'm also a resident of the island of North Haven and certainly uh, look forward to a roadmap that considers the interests of coastal communities and fishermen. So really excited to be here and really appreciative of all of the leaders who have joined us as well. Thanks, Hannah. So we also have Stephanie Watson on the phone uh, and Stephanie is probably the most important person here in terms of making sure this roadmap works. Uh, Stephanie, you wanna introduce yourself and your role? Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Watson and I'm the Offshore Wind Program Manager for the state of Maine and the Governor's Energy Office. Uh, I was born and raised on Mount Desert Island. Uh, and like Jonathan, I spent a lot of time on the shore and on the water. And I'm really excited to be part of this process for the state of Maine. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Now, I didn't, did I miss anybody here on in our advisory committee or any other staff that's here that I'm missing? I think I got everybody. Okay, great. Before we move forward with our agenda, I do wanna recognize again that we have now 117 people joining us um, uh, as observers today. Um, and we're gonna do two things. One, I wanna reiterate how folks who are observing can participate today. Um, the chat function is not enabled for you. However, at the end of the meeting, we will have a moment where we're gonna open up uh, a way of providing written comment that we can all see. So there's gonna be this public comment moment at the end. So we encourage you to stick around for that. Um, and uh, we'll be talking as well then about how the public can stay intimately involved in this process. We also wanted to do a quick poll and this should just go to the members of the uh, attendees and the public who are watching us today. Maggie can launch a, launch a quick poll um, to, to figure out who's with us. And so this poll just asks you, who do you identify as? And it gives you a couple choices and then an other. Um, and so Maggie, if you could launch that poll um, and that should only be answered by people who are um, joining us as observers today. So you should see, if you're an observer, you'll see this. And I don't know if advisory committee members, you can see this. If not, it's happening. I can see it as a, uh, as a co-host here. Um, so uh, if you're a member of the public, just click on whatever uh, affiliation feels most appropriate for you. There's an other option or there should be somewhere. Um, if there isn't, we apologize. <clears throat> there is. You may have to, it's a long list. Um, so if you're not seeing something, you can scroll a little bit on there. Great. Yeah. Scroll down a little bit and there's two more at the bottom. <clears throat> so we'll just give that a moment. We've got 93, 94 out of the 117 answering. So that's a great response. Let's give it just one more sec. Anybody else wants to click on there? <clears throat> we'll just give you one more minute. Again, member observers who are with us today, please go ahead and so we get a sense who's in the room with us. Okay. Great. So Maggie, why don't you go ahead and stop that and, and share the share the poll so we can all see it. All right, so are you looking at that, folks? Um, and if you scroll uh, scroll down, you can see a few on the other. Um, so just so you know, there is a diversity of folks listening in and being part of our meeting today, ranging from basically every single option that we put out there. Um, and so thanks for everybody who's with us today at this meeting. Okay, with that, let's get our agenda going. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for those introductions. I'm going to turn it back to Dan, uh, who, uh, together with uh, Admiral Johnson, are going to uh, walk us through some essential context of our work. Um, and we'll do a block of slides uh, that'll take about 15 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll have a block of time to ask some questions about that. And remember, this is our first block that's more about context. Uh, we'll have some discussion and then we'll do another block around what this roadmap thing is and what we can, how to get our hands around what really, uh, what we're, we're really producing here as a group. Okay, so Dan, let me send it back to you and I will share my screen again with, uh, with these slides um, for you to walk through. 
Thanks, David. So, as, as mentioned, and as, as you know, uh, this, this work stems from the U.S. EDA grant that we received. And just for context there, U.S. EDA is, a, um, uh, is within the Commerce Department of the federal government. Um, so this, uh, you know, this work is really focused a, a lot on the economic development opportunities um, uh, that, that come, with, come with offshore wind. And as folks mentioned in the introduction, is really going to build on the existing work that's been done um, related to offshore wind. Uh, building on that that, that record and um, more than a dec decade of work on the issue, and then also ensuring the sustainability of our uh, coastal heritage, existing ocean users, and the environment. So if you go to the next slide, this, this all fits within uh, or underneath the umbrella of the main offshore wind initiative. And the main offshore wind initiative contains multiple components, of which we won't get into all of them, uh, uh, but from this, this roadmap really does offer that planning opportunity. Um, as you know, and as we may get into more, uh, there is uh, uh, work being done on the research side with the uh, 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 research array that is uh, being proposed, and we'll talk a little bit more. The, the port uh, studies and investments that, that Mac, Matt and uh, James talked about, the opportunities for Searsport and other ports, the regional coordination and collaboration that's being done, with other other states and through through BOEM and other means, and then through the advancement of public private partnerships. So all of these kind of uh, offshore wind related activities, of, of which there are many and not all are captured here, those are all under the main offshore wind initiative umbrella. Um, and so this is a is, is going to be a crucial part of that. I'll note we are this morning launching a new uh, web page, main to offshorewind.org. Uh, which should be should be up later uh, this morning or later today um, as well. And a lot of the materials and information on all these uh, areas will be posted there. Next slide. So when you look at the uh, the process for this roadmap specifically, and we'll spend some time later talking talking about it, but I want to set the context. This is this is the start of it. This is the first phase where we are um, uh, going to be working on initial work and in, initial recommendations between now and the end of the year. Uh, at the beginning of uh, next year, we're going to work to refine and consolidate those recommendations, continue to do analysis, take, take public uh, input and feedback um, through about next summer, and then oh, between next summer and next fall, working to really finalize that uh, roadmap content, finalize the materials, and finalize the plan by the end of 2022. Um, and then beyond that, working on communicating um, and uh, and effectuating and implementing recommendations as necessary. So this is the beginning, and uh, we're really excited to to get started. But with that, I'm going to turn it turn it over to my co-chair uh, Grog to talk about the opportunity. Looks like you're still on mute, Grog. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dan. And uh, again, it's a pleasure to be with you all today and an honor to serve on uh, this uh, committee or advisory group. Um, I'm not seeing the, yeah, there. Uh, as you can see, um, most of, almost all of the development that's been done in offshore power now is in uh, fixed sites in the shallower water to take full advantage of the opportunity that uh, our oceans provide us for offshore uh, wind power, uh, we're gonna have to get into floating technology. And basically the cutoff line there is 60 meters, 200 feet. And that's what we're uh, focusing on uh, today. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, what is happening right now. Right now where we are 20, 20 to 2025, it's roughly uh, eight uh, mega, uh, gig, gigawatts, 8,000 uh, megawatts coming online each year. But uh, just in the, the next 10 years up to 2030, uh, the world is going to, that's uh, going to accelerate and we're going to start taking on uh, 25 to 30 gigawatts per, per year. And that, uh, depending on what you want to use as a marker, but let's just say the average uh, power plant coal-fired power plant uh, produces about 600 megawatts uh, that we're talking about being able to substitute up to 50 uh, coal-fired power plants with the 
kind of offshore wind power that's coming online uh, each year by the time we get to 2030. Next. Uh, and uh, the growth in uh, offshore floating technology is increasing at a rate even greater than the overall. And so offshore floating technology capacity will become a greater and or a larger and larger segment of the overall growth as we head out towards 2030. Right now it's about 10% and it'll grow to an ever increasing percentage of the overall growth in offshore wind power. And uh, we wanna be a part of that. I think the foot stomper is that, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, as you can see, uh, there isn't, all of our is aspirational at this point. You can see off the coast of uh, New England, southern coast of New England, there's already a lot of progress in going down the Eastern seaboard, uh, uh, much more uh, already leases already let, and then uh, those that have financial backing and are actually under construction. And interestingly, I'm in Beaufort, North Carolina right now, visiting family this week. And last evening we were out uh, in a boat just cruising around the area and three miles away over in Moorhead City, is the port there and uh, the ship in port uh, is offloading segments of the towers that are going to a facility up off uh, uh, up near the North Carolina Virginia border a uh, huge ship huge segments and uh, they're loaded on tractor trailers trucked up there and then they'll put on barges and go out to the facility but I'm not sure where that ship came from with those segments on it but uh, it was just kind of a coincidence that we go out to uh, kind of have a pre-dinner cocktail. And uh, that's the first thing I see when we uh, get underway. Next slide. I think this shows you the incredible opportunity that the state of Maine has. If you look at the lower left map, you'll see that uh, the darker the shade of red, the more capable the wind power is. And the Gulf of Maine, if you can see on the Eastern seaboard, uh, is the primary place in the entire East Coast uh, that has the best wind. Uh, it is accessible in terms of the technology that we have today to move power around, accessible by the entire Northeast. It's controlled, of course, by federal government and they are gonna provide leases there. So uh, as Terry said, uh, you know, we can, be on the table or we can be on the menu. And I would recommend that uh, we find a way for our state to be on the table because we have an incredible opportunity. We're already uh, a hub for uh, research and technology uh, due to the work of a lot of people, but the, in particular Habib's group up at the University of Maine. And the other incredible advantage we have is just plain old geographic proximity. And so whether we're supporting this for our own state of Maine renewable energy goals, uh, but much larger is the renewable goals of all of New England. And uh, that is going to be used. So we might as well be the hub for the construction of all of that capacity and then the ongoing maintenance of it. And that gets into huge economic impact and a number of very valuable and important jobs for our people and our communities along the coast and in fact, across the entire state of Maine. Uh, next. And this gives you a summary. And again, uh, I think the foot stopper is that we need to, I think, uh, approach this project and this opportunity with a certain sense of energy. You can see that several of the other New England states are much further ahead than we are. Uh, they're going to develop it and they're going to expand much faster than we do. And also their long-term uh, requirements are gonna be much more significant. But again, I think that uh, we want to be uh, on the menu, uh, I mean, be on the table and take advantage of this and become the hub, not only for research, and not only to provide the important part that, re that offshore renewable energy will provide to our own state goals, but be a hub for whatever the rest of the Northeast does in this particular area of renewable energy going out into the future. Uh, and I think that completes my segment and I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Dan. Thanks, Rod. 
apologies at the zoom i have a dog barking somewhere outside so um uh so grog is set the kind of uh global national and even kind of regional context for the opportunity for for offshore wind um which i think is really helpful for the work and something we'll talk more about through the process kind of looking at you know what makes sense for maine and what uh knowing that offshore wind is growing uh, you know kind of how can we develop the capacity needed to support um offshore wind and make sure that there are benefits to the state and that we're you know taking a main um, main approach to this and so the main offshore wind initiative um really kind of has four overarching goals of which this roadmap will be a key part of so fighting climate change harnessing renewable energy creating jobs and economic growth and then sustaining maine's maritime heritage next slide you heard uh, uh, Director Pingree talk about uh, the Maine Climate Council, talk about the uh, greenhouse gas reduction requirements that are in Maine statute of producing emissions 45% by 2030 from 1990 levels and 80% by, by 2050. You know, I think we're seeing and, and I think we're all aware that these, uh, you know, really do have, you know, as, as the climate change really is impacting Maine, we've got uh, the Gulf of Maine warming faster than um, uh, all 99% of the world's oceans, we're seeing more extreme temperatures, and we see off, uh, offshore wind, uh, and you're seeing it around the world and, and in the region, but also see it as an opportunity to diversify our fossil fuel uh, and reduce our fossil fuel dependence. Next slide. Maine is actually the most uh, home heating oil dependent state in the country, and we spend uh, over $4 billion a year annually, annually to import fossil fuels. And uh, with an unmatched uh, Gulf of Maine uh, wind speed resource and, or uh, un, unmatched uh, um, sustained wind speeds in the Gulf, it really is a, a, a major opportunity. We have a requirement for 80% of our renewable en of our energy to come from renewable resources through our renewable portfolio standard by 2030. Um, and then a goal of 100% renewable energy by 2050. Um, and as you think about, um, if you've been following the Climate Council and some of the outcomes there, you know that uh, in order to meet some of our targets, we will need to grow the amount of um, uh, uh, clean energy to match the electrification that's happening in our heating and transportation sectors. So as we as we grow the number of electric vehicles on the road, the number of heat pumps, we'll need to make sure that we have the renewable energy to back that up. Um, and uh, Clean energy, renewable energy, and offshore wind uh, will play, I believe, will play an, an important part of that. Next slide. We also see uh, renewable energy and offshore wind in particular as a real opportunity for uh, creating jobs and economic growth. If you look nationally, wind and solar uh, technicians are two of the top three fastest growing uh, um, um, jobs across the country. Um, and that is not, you know, that is from uh, U.S. Census data, uh, so it is you know seen um, around the country as a really big opportunity. And if you look at the opportunity in Maine, we actually have uh, lower per capita uh, numbers in some of the clean energy jobs, and so it really is a growth opportunity for um, uh, for Maine. And that job growth is is emerging across the spectrum, both in skilled trades, but also marine sciences, manufacturing, uh, shipbuilding, surveying, all of those opportunities. So we feel like we can build an opportunity that um, builds on our decade of experience, research and innovation, some of the public-private partnerships that were mentioned, as well as our uh, deep water ports and other um, infrastructure opportunities that exist here already. Next slide. And at, at the same time, it's important that we sustain our, our main heritage, so work together to minimize impacts on fishing and responsibly advance offshore wind. Uh, we think we can grow a vibrant economy that respects and invests in um, marine industries and communities, and that we can protect and preserve Maine's ocean environment through rigorous research and scientific partnerships. So I think a lot of that work is, is happening in other areas, but will be a key part of this, this roadmap uh, effort as well. Next slide. So just a, a, uh, for those that are uh, not kind of living this day to day, uh, there have been a number of different um, uh, 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 updates or developments that have occurred related to the offshore wind in Maine, and we won't get into the details of every one, but I did want to make sure this group is aware of a couple pieces of legislation um, that has uh, that were passed and signed into law. 
The first is LD1619, which does a few things. This is a, a governor's bill uh, that, that the governor filed and put forward that um, uh, was modified uh, through the process, through the legislative process a little bit, but was signed into law. Uh, and it, what it does is it prohibits installation of offshore wind turbines within state waters, so three miles from the coast or state territorial waters. Um, it does have exceptions for the existing um, uh, New England Aqua Venice project that's going up off the coast of Monhegan. Uh, for some limited small-scale pilots, uh, the prohibition does not um, refer to port side infrastructure that's needed to support offshore wind um, or transmission infrastructure. There, there are some uh, conditions on the transmission infrastructure. One is that this uh, roadmap process be completed. And so this is a you know, going to be an important part of, of um, you know, ensuring responsible um, development of offshore wind, including the transmission infrastructure that's needed. The legislation also creates a separate entity uh, uh, called the Research Consortium, uh, which the GEO will coordinate, uh, bringing together experts and looking at uh, what's needed for um, uh, additional research uh, related to offshore wind and particularly related to the research array that's, that's moving forward. I want to note that this legislation uh, uh, among, uh, received uh, strong bipartisan support, um, and so it was uh, uh, great to see the, um, you know, the Legislature Act to, to move this forward. Next slide. The other piece of legislation was LD336, which is a, an act to encourage uh, research to support the main offshore wind industry. And this uh, legislation also passed with bipartisan support directs the Public Utilities Commission to negotiate a power purchase agreement for the floating offshore wind research array for up to 144 megawatts. And so this is really a, a crucial component of, of moving forward the, the research array. Um, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about that later today and, and, and in other meetings, but is really a, um, uh, is what's needed to have that project uh, be financed and, and move forward. It also requires a study of transmission infrastructure. Um, and what what will be needed to uh, for for this project and others, but looking at ways to protect uh, the environment and marine users um, to ensure that we're we're developing transmission for these projects in a in a prudent way. Um, and so that that may be that will be something you know the transmission will be something that's talked about in in some of the working group uh, discussions. Next slide. So in November of last year, uh, the governor announced her, uh, her, the intent for the state to uh, apply for a uh, research array lease with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, beginning in December of last year, uh, led by Selena Cunningham uh, and the GEO uh, and, and with others uh, across, across state government, moved forward with a uh, uh, multi-month, uh, several meetings and, and research and interviews and, and others to really identify where this uh, research array um, um, can be located. And if you've um, seen, seen the news or, or not, but uh, the, we have released a preferred site for this uh, small research array up to, up to 12 turbine project, 16 square miles, held a joint work session um, yesterday afternoon evening to review the materials related to the, to the joint site, uh, to the preferred site. In a, in a working session and are taking comments on that through the end of this month. Now that is a separate separate process, but wanted to make sure that this group and others were aware of, of the uh, progress being made there. I'll have someone from the CBI team or, or someone from the team to post uh, into the chat where uh, more information about where, the, where that process is, is going and where comments can be submitted. Um, but again, those, those comments uh, are due by the end of July. The, our, our office will We'll review them and then ultimately put forward a, an application uh, to uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for a 16 square mile site uh, for the research array project. Next slide. So that is the overview of, of kind of the, the global, national, and then state opportunities. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, David. Super, great. So we have some time for have a conversation around this before we get into the details of the roadmap itself. And Stephanie will walk us through that in a little bit. Um, but before we that, do that, there was a fair amount of information that was um, laid out there, some essential context. And I'd welcome comments, reflections, thoughts on it. 
Terry, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so, so it. Uh, I guess the question is for Dan. Um, should be we? I mean, we where that's public comment is going to close the 30, 30th or thirty first of this month. Thirty first, I think. So, uh, of this month. Uh, shouldn't we be commenting on the researcher? Uh, is that what you're looking for today? Comments on where we think the researcher race should be concentrating uh, its effort, whether it be uh, anchoring, uh, what kind of baseline data we need for habitat in that area, uh, uh, how we're going to fund that habitat uh, research in that area. Um, Stuff like that, that. Is that what we should be concentrating on today, or should we be concentrating on the roadmap? I mean, because I'm assuming this this panel will be commenting on that research array at this point. I mean, that seems to be the pressing thing right now. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Terry. And I didn't mean to confuse any sort of uh, uh, um, purpose. Really, just want to kind of give the context and for anyone listening to be aware of kind of what what was happening with regards to the research array. Um, you know, I think if in, if individual members of this group and obviously others want to comment on on the research array, there is that separate process to do that. Um, this is really about kind of launching a, the 18 month effort of 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 the roadmap. Um, so I don't expect we'll spend time digging into the details of what was discussed in the public meeting yesterday, but more wanted to make sure that uh, uh, this group and others were aware of that separate comment process. That's a good question. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Yeah. Are there other reflections or comments or confusions folks have about this essential context? Things that people want to emphasize that are particularly meaningful for them, for you. Um, other reflections on this? Yeah, Don. Um, it, 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 is con it is confusing that, that there are kind of multiple offshore wind processes at play in parallel. Um, you know, as somebody who has been, you know, deeply involved in the past and has just been, you know, watching the process unfold, um, uh, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to understand how these all fold together and who's kind of on lead uh, with what. Um, uh, and I suspect for members of the public, um, this is very true. So it, it would be helpful if someone could just, you know, kind of lay out, you know, here are the parallel, parallel strands of work and how do they relate to each other, um, et cetera. Dan, do you want to take a stab at that? I'm happy to put up one of those slides, that slide that has the different pieces of the puzzle on it, uh, if that would be a helpful aid to answer Don's question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that um, there are, by necessity, multiple efforts happening. I mean, I think that uh, we have, um, um, you know the same people that are, are that are uh, or the same experts working at on ports and infrastructure won't necessarily uh, need to be engaged in in others, right? And so I think it's it's about bringing those uh, pieces together under the umbrella of the offshore wind initiative. Um, and so I think you know either um, you know kind of now or or throughout the next meeting, David, we can provide a better kind of uh, chart so folks can see exactly where everything fits together. This process is this roadmap process is really about, and we'll talk a little bit, and I think maybe it might help to look at kind of the as we go through the structure of what the roadmap process will look at and focus on, is really about um, beginning to bring some of those pieces together in some of the working groups and through the advisory council to, um, you know, take that more comprehensive and holistic approach to it. That is that is part of the purpose of the roadmap is that comprehensive approach. Thanks, Dan. Patrice, I see your hands up. Yeah, I guess I'm just curious for some feedback about how this planning process actually fits in to bridge us from sort of all the aspirational slides that we see, like all the opportunity, all of the great things that it can mean for Maine versus the reality. 
um, the slide that other states along the Atlantic coast are far ahead of us, like the state of Massachusetts has already invested significantly in the port of New Bedford for you know, some of these purposes. So I guess I just get a little lost with the dream and the promise versus where we really are in the pecking order and how Maine overcomes the obstacles of just timeline wise being at such a significant disadvantage because these things are being built in other states. They are being constructed, assembled, ships are being built. Um, so how is the planning process gonna address those in addition to the main specific questions that we have? That's a great question. I, and I, it, it definitely prompts us to go into the roadmap conversation. And so I'm feeling kind of a, an urge to go there. Before we do that, I don't know, Dan, uh, Stephanie, Selena, if you want to preview any answer for Patrice right now. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a great question. And I think that's, uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind immediately is the uh, leading advantage we have on on floating offshore wind. All of that development to the south of us has been in fixed bottom and in and more shallow waters where, whereas kind of our, um, you know, I think the significant opportunity for, for Maine, both in kind of what uh, uh, what could be um, uh, moving forward in Maine, and and also how we support other, you know, the developments in other states is around is around the floating technology, which is, um, you know, I think a really, but we are I think beginning to be in a global leadership position with some of the actions we're taking, and I think that that's part of it. But I I think that is exactly what we're going to talk about next is kind of that more focused piece. But so I think you're right, David. To, Maybe key us into that part next. Yeah. So before we we transition, are there other comments that people want to say about this context? Because I feel there is a hunger to talk about the roadmap itself and what the heck it really is. Um, but before we do that, is there any other comment around context that we want to lift up before we shift gears here? Yeah, David. Uh, yeah. Patrice, thank you for that question, and uh, I think you really—that's the crux of the issue. And uh, so. I think it, the information we presented uh, tells you the story that there is, has to be some sense of urgency in this whole thing because it is gonna happen. And the incredible resource that the Gulf of Maine is in terms of offshore wind power is gonna be used. And so I think we have to give, our, give serious thought to how we're gonna protect our maritime heritage that we have in Maine and how we're gonna incorporate the reality that the Gulf of Maine resource is going to be used and let's hope it's used by Maine and the construction of whatever goes out there, whether it's done by to support Massachusetts goals or Connecticut's goals or New Jersey's goals or New York's goals, uh, that we're part of it. And uh, so uh, that's what the roadmap is for, or that's what we're going to be about over the next 18 months to figure out how we do all of that. And so I guess the best thing is to get on with the, the roadmap, but you nailed it. And that's why this is, whole process is underway. Thank you. I see a hand from Habib. Go ahead, Habib. Uh, yeah, just uh, wanted to follow up on Patrice's question. Excellent question. Um, yes, Maine is behind, if you wish, in terms of actually uh, leasing offshore wind areas and so on and so forth. But Maine is leading in R&D relating to floating offshore wind. We're the leader in the United States. Uh, we have the largest research group in floating offshore wind in the country right now. Um, there's over 60 patents that the University of Maine has on floating offshore wind technology, not only in Maine, but throughout the, the country and the world. And we're actually positioning ourselves here uh, by 2024 is to have the first floater in the United States. So we'll be the first to actually get a floater in the US if everything stays on schedule. So, so from a floating perspective, and if you think of floating as being the future of offshore wind, Maine is greatly positioned to lead in that space. So in this, this particular roadmap effort will help us uh, actually put, put in place a, a program that will allow us to do that, so. Great, so I see hands from Patrice and Terry. Let's do some quick more comments and then let's go ahead and look at the sort of details of the roadmap, which hopefully will give better context for this conversation. But Patrice, go ahead and then Terry. Yeah, just, just to follow up, and, and I appreciate um, those responses, and I appreciate Maine's commitment to moving forward with floating offshore wind. I just, I guess, would like to say out of the gate, I hope 
we haven't pre-decided um, all of the solutions for the Gulf of Maine. There are definitely a lot of concerns given the scale of floating technology with some of the ecological and environmental disruptions. And there have been advances in hybrid technologies and fixed gear technologies being further out. Um, so I just hope we can keep an open mind um, in terms of potential impacts on the marine users, given the pace that all of this technology is changing, um, that you know, there's very likely a place for floating offshore wind, but there may be space for some of these hybrid models or fixed models deeper from shore, which may have a positive trade-off on the marine ecological environment side. So I just hope we're not, you know, because because we are a leader in floating offshore wind, that that doesn't negate other potential options for us in deep water as those evolve. Thanks, Patrice. Terry? Uh, yeah, so just thinking about this, you know, I, I, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but the only uh, array in Southern New England, at least, that's in state waters is a Block Island array. And that was the only one that went the process we're using here, right? The rest of them went to, to get those lease areas down in Southern New England, all the way down in New Jersey, uh, North Carolina. Those are all use, using the bone process, not, not a state. So Massachusetts has nothing in the state waters. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah, thanks for the question, Terry. So the, um, there are turbines in the water right now. There's the, Block Island project, which is in state waters. There is the uh, Virginia project, which is a, a research project. So it's a federal uh, bone, smaller research project. Um, so you're um, just a little bit of clarification, clarification there. The kind of the map that you saw from 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 Grog was really those those were federal lease areas. So if you look at kind of larger projects coming. Um, those are our federal lease areas, and so the the main approach of the um, you know the one the one turbine project off Monhegan that that's in state waters, the research array will be in federal. And in, in, in to emphasize that point, that now with the legislation there is you know a prohibition on state water development. So this is all about development in federal waters, where the federal government has a big say in how that goes down. So part of this is Maine asserting itself to figure out how are we as much as possible in the driver's seat, um, knowing that there's a federal process out there and these are federal waters. Okay, um, great. So why don't we do a pivot and um, I'll turn it over to Stephanie to walk us through the sort of idea of what this roadmap is and how it fits into exactly the kinds of conversations we're having right now. Um, so, Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you and I'll put the slides up again um, and let you walk us through um, the vision of what the ne next 18 months might produce, what this roadmap thing could be. Okay, great. David, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, super. Um, this conversation, I think, is a really great lead up to this next section. Um, all these different perspectives and concerns and hopes. Um, that's what the roadmap is for. We're going to capture all this and figure out how to do offshore wind in a way that makes the most sense for Maine. Um, and as Dan noted early on, uh, the roadmap is a really essential piece of the overall Maine offshore wind initiative. And what I hope to do in the next few slides is present a proposed, and I'll underline and bold face the proposed, um, overview of the roadmap, uh, a general outline, deliverables, and then we hope to look to you, the advisory committee, um, to help give us some feedback on those and help us shape that moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, as Dan mentioned, um, Maine was basically given a gift from the US Economic Development Administration to give us the opportunity to shape the offshore wind future for Maine. Um, and we can build on the essential ingredients that we already have here in our state, our research and development capacity, our high value wind resource, our proximity to the large energy markets in the Northeast, uh, our natural, natural resource-based heritage, 
um, are enterprising people. If nothing else, Mainers know how to get things done. Um, and the offshore wind innovation experience that we have in our state for that stretches back over at least a decade. So what we need to do in this in this roadmap is figure out how we can work together, identify what we want to do and how we want to do it. And we need to find a way to ensure the sustainability of our main coastal heritage, our existing ocean users, and our Gulf of Maine ecosystem. Next slide. So the opportunity to shape our future is actually right now. And how are we going to accomplish this? I think one of the first steps we want to take is to learn from others. Um, we also want to be sharing information and analyzing the many facets of offshore wind. So this includes looking at energy markets, looking at ports and infrastructure, doing a comprehensive view of socioeconomic impacts, equity, um, the sustainability elements that I mentioned before, our supply chains, our workforce development, and additional innovation and research opportunities. And in terms of who's doing the work, um, it's all of us here. It's the uh, GEO staff, also several working groups with broad public input and additional technical support from consultants. Next slide, please. Okay. So just to focus a little bit more on who will actually be doing the work, let's start in the middle, which is all of you, the advisory committee. Um, the advisory committee is comprised of representatives across the public and private sectors with different areas of expertise, but all relevant to offshore wind and from all regions of Maine. And you will be helping advise GEO on the development of the roadmap. Um, the advisory committee includes the co-chairs from the four different working groups that you can see listed here, as well as uh, at-large members. The four working groups, which is just below the advisory committee, will each be providing technical knowledge and subject matter expertise. These groups also will be comprised of public and private sector representatives with that subject matter expertise, the technical knowledge, and the relationships um, throughout the state and beyond to help inform our roadmap process. Um, these groups will also be sharing ideas and resources with one another. Um, in addition to these groups and the advisory committee, uh, we will have some consultants assist the working groups and provide uh, technical studies that offer the necessary data that we need to help inform the roadmap. And we'll also be getting stakeholder and broad broader public input to help share ideas, issues, and concerns for the roadmap process. Next slide, please. And we heard a little bit about these and the introductions that uh, people were giving. And I think these are key principles that we want to keep in mind moving forward. We need this to be an inclusive process, an equitable one. And so in terms of equity, really, we're thinking about considering the distribution of benefits and burdens, what um, participation of all impacted communities throughout the state, and also incorporating strategies to address any inequities that may be already existing, or there may be some that um, crop up through the course of this project. We have uh, a goal to be open, transparent and maintain an open door. We want to share information, but also get a lot of feedback to help inform this. We'd like to be data driven. So collecting and displaying data from sources that are well vetted and continue efforts to expand that pool of data that we can draw on, especially through collaborative research processes. Maine's really good at that. And I think that's a place that we can continue to exceed. Um, partnerships. We're building on partnerships with organizations to increase our reach and participation. So leveraging the work that many of you have already uh, put in place to make sure that we get additional partnerships, additional feedback from the public. Next slide, please. Um, this is a proposed roadmap outline. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through this deliberatively, uh, because I think that these are the kind of pieces 
we'd like to hear some feedback from you all on. So again, as I mentioned, we'd like to start with learning from other states and other countries' experiences with offshore wind uh, and as actually assess the energy markets for offshore wind, including how much Maine needs and when to meet clean energy and climate goals. We'd like to analyze the socioeconomic costs and benefits of offshore wind for the state of Maine, um, evaluating our existing opportunity or existing and potential opportunities with our supply chain, uh, with our workforce, with the ports that we have here in the state, the vessels and other marine infrastructure. Um, we also will plan to identify existing data and gaps that we have in that data, additional needs and best practices that we can promote to protect Maine's existing ocean users and Gulf of Maine ecosystem. Uh, also research floating offshore wind technology to sustain the existing ocean users in the environment. Um, also looking at lowering the cost of offshore wind energy um, and strengthening Maine's position as a center of research and innovation for offshore wind. So part of this also um, relates to the research array that we were talking about earlier and integrating what we know from that process with the roadmap and vice versa. So we'll be looking for input from the working groups to help inform uh, the research array process. And then finally, we'll be pri prioritizing specific recommendations, hopefully with timelines, uh, to improve Maine's role in the offshore wind energy sector. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so what can we learn? Um, again, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on this slide. So last night at the research array meeting, I heard numerous questions about this. Like, what can we learn from other places that have implemented offshore wind? Um, and I think that's a really fair question and that's a good place for us to be starting. So we can learn both the good and the bad lessons from offshore wind activities in other places around the world. Um, we need to do that to gain a full picture of potential benefits and costs and help inform our process here. Um, we can pay particular attention to lessons learned on floating offshore wind. And although it's not deployed widely yet around the world, there are some places in Europe in Scotland and Portugal, for example, where we can draw from the lessons um, from those implementations there. So floating, as I'm saying, is still in early days, but it's growing at an astonishing rate around the world. Um, for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons is the ability to adapt that technology from fixed um, to deeper waters. And um, those are things that we can continue to explore throughout our roadmap process. But we wanna learn about the lessons on floating offshore wind that have been um, learned elsewhere, like in Scotland and in Portugal. And there are a couple of things that I think we could just reflect on a little bit from those. So the technology is really feasible, but more work is needed on some pieces like dynamic cabling, the wind resource potential uh, available to floating offshore wind technologies is even greater than expected. Um, more work is needed on understanding interactions with fisheries. Um, we can also learn from those experiences how to develop ports in our supply chain to support offshore wind, but also to support the local economies. And there are some similarities in the supply chain for fixed offshore wind that can be adapted to floating. So these are just some examples of things we can learn elsewhere. And again, really broad brush. I'm not trying to draw any technical conclusions or anything like that, but just to show that the state of Maine and we through the roadmap process will need to be looking at those experiences and applying them to our process but then also really trying to think about what makes sense for the state of Maine. Next slide, please. Right. So again, proposed or anticipated outputs of an integrated Maine offshore wind roadmap. Um, so basically we're going to be trying to provide what we have, where are the gaps and what are our opportunities to improve. Uh, floating can be a priority, but our mode, our roadmap can include others. It can, you know, as Patrice is noting, incorporating 
looking at how we can support uh, fixed technology in other places, how we could maybe support hybrid technology in other places. Um, again, we can, we can have the floating focus, but be broad in our perspective on how Maine can participate in the larger offshore wind sector. Um, so in terms of our outputs, looking at assessments and action plans, specifically focusing on energy markets and socioeconomic analyses, uh, workforce and talent, supply chain. So in Maine, this also, I think, makes sense to include shipbuilding and vessels, operations and maintenance with vessels, um, the ports, the interconnections to the grid, transmission of electricity, other infrastructure, and uh, ocean user and ecosystem data, criteria and best practices to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts. Um, and then we hope within the roadmap to provide recommendations that are prioritized by category. And these are just some logical groupings of recommendations we could include leadership programs, partnership opportunities, policies, laws, and regulations, data and information and research and innovation needs, and also where, where we need to provide additional investments and different funding opportunities. So the outcome of our roadmap will be uh, recommendations that implement a common vision to stand up a fully integrated offshore wind industry, which used, utilizes Maine's assets and also uh, provides plans to improve our workforce, attract new talent, participate in the offshore wind industry, improve our supply chain, et cetera. Next slide, please. Okay, I think this brings us, David, to a discussion. Excellent, thanks. So, Stephanie's given us a flavor of what this thing is we're trying to build together, right? Um, and it's going to take us some time to do it. There's going to be things that happen along the way that are more immediate term implementation things that even happen before December 2022. But this is what we're trying to do. Um, and now is a chance to really wrap our heads. Okay, what's, what's making sense here? What's a little confusing? Um, Grant, why don't you kick us off and then I'll uh, offer a guiding question on this. Grant, go ahead, please. Um, I guess I have a, more of a direct question for Dan. I know that um, in its uh, beginning stages here, when you were uh, you went on a trip to Scotland, um, there was kind of an MOU that was put out there. And I was wondering if you could uh, kind of bring us up to speed on what stage that MOU was at. Um, in particular in Scotland, I think they had a little bit of a volley where they were in the market for getting three different turbine stations or, or ports to, uh, to facilitate the offshore wind farm. And then they ended up not really getting any of that. And then um, I believe that they the spacing was a problem for fisheries after the farm was in there. So um, I don't, you, you were the one who went to Scotland. So <laughs> those are assumptions of mine, obviously. And then, um, you know, moving forward for this group, I think it's important to, um, you know, think about the uh, people that have really good paying jobs that exist already in the fossil fuel industry and how we're gonna make that transition possible for them, possibly with operations and maintenance. I know that um, Wyman Station particularly has about 25 um, employees in there. They're um, graduates of Maine Maritime, they're union electricians, so they have uh, good paying jobs. And I think that, you know, the operations and maintenance of these, uh, these vessels, if you will, um, is a good transition for them to get out of, out of there. Because, you know, my hope for offshore wind in Maine is we're going to start closing down some of these stations like that, that uh, run on oil. Um, they're only operational for two or three or weeks a year when there's a draw that's too much for uh, natural gas or renewables to handle. So there's a lot there, I know, but... <laughs> Thanks, Grant. I wonder, Dan, if you want to mention the Scotland trip and how you envision that MOU being helpful in the roadmap process, in addition to the other pieces that Grant said at the end. Yeah, thanks, Grant. So uh, last um, uh, December, the after um, uh, traveling to, to, to the United Kingdom, the governor a few things came out of it. One was, um, you know, the um, announcement that we'd begin 
doing some work uh, analyzing the opportunity for main sports, particularly Sears Port. But then last December, the governor signed a MOU with um, uh, the United Kingdom, their energy minister, and she signed an MOU. And so, you know, it's been uh, seven months or so since that, since that was signed. We've had a few different shared uh, uh, or, or kind of collaborative events earlier this this year. Um, uh, you know, the MOU was really around um, sharing of, of information, best practices, uh, working to connect kind of industry um, and other opportunities. So we've done some of that in partnership with the International Trade uh, Office, Mitzi and, and Wade Merritt and his team. And so we'll seek to do more of that, um, um, both on kind of the, you know, the, uh, the opportunity for the private sector, but also kind of sharing best practices and information of, of what they've learned through their um, through their work. And so I think there's there's more to be done on that. I'm, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll um, you know, did some earlier this year and I envision, um, you know, beginning to do more of that, particularly as this process moves forward. Moves forward. Um, so I think more to come on that. And I'm happy to share the, the MOU with, with, with this group if they haven't seen it yet. Great. Okay. Um, I see some other hands. Tom, go ahead, please. Hang on a second, Tom. There you go. Getting myself unmuted. Um, a, a question about what the the result of the of the uh, process is going to look like. And I was struck by the by the one of the earlier the slide a couple of slides ago that suggested that one of the question one of the results of the process would be the question of what more data you needed. So I guess the question is: Is it is it your vision that this will result in recommendations that already contain the relevant data in order to make decisions? Or is it that we'll come to the end of the process and say, here are a bunch of more questions we need to answer? I'm kind of hoping for the former. And, and in that context, will there be sufficient resources available to dive into the data and do some of the research and present the information to this group that will enable us to make some of the recommendations um, other than simply saying, yeah, there are a few more questions we need to answer. Um, and let me just pivot a little bit from that question um, and, and go back to the comment uh, about the job displacement. Um, hey, Tom, by the way, your microphone's a little low. So if you want to like, there yeah, you go, lean forward, you might be louder. Yeah. Um, the, the question of job displacement is actually an interesting one because it is so broad in the context of beneficial electrification. We're not just talking about Wyman Station. We're talking about all the gas station attendants and propane deliverers. I mean, if you actually electrify a system completely as the climate change plan envisions, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to need to be, uh, whose needs are gonna be addressed. And I suspect that that is kind of outside the scope of this particular effort. That's a much broader question. Um, so I wonder if the focus here couldn't be characterized as, you know, what kinds of particular job opportunities could be created by offshore wind and floating offshore wind? And then how would those feed into a different process for addressing the broader question of sort of retraining a vast number of main uh, workers? Thanks, Tom. So on the first question, Stephanie, do you want to just say a word when you talk about the data uh, requirements that may be a product of this? What kind of data are you talking about there? Yeah, I think, um, Tom, thank you for the question. I think there, there's both, right? So we'll be collecting data through this process, both through um, staff support to the working groups, but also through additional technical consultants that we'll bring on to help us assess things like our offshore wind supply chain and workforce opportunity, looking at our energy markets analysis and potential socioeconomic impacts. Um, also looking at uh, collecting data to help inform how uh, to do offshore wind that minimizes impacts to ocean users and the environment. So we do have resources within the roadmap process to collect a considerable amount of data that I hope will inform that well. Um, but I do, I feel like we'll also still have some questions 
that we'll want to put forward for future funding opportunities. And that will be part of the set of recommendations. Those uh, recommendations, hopefully we can even identify potential specific funding sources to um, meet those additional data needs. So I think it's both. We're gonna collect data through this process to help inform the roadmap, but in doing that, we're likely to find some additional data gaps that we'll need to fill subsequently. So Thanks. That's, yeah. I mean, and I, I don't wanna lose the fact that there's a second piece of that comment from Tom about workforce and how we're thinking about it. And I wonder if we just park that for a moment and we're gonna come back after the break and look at the working group plan sort of focus areas. And let's see if we're hitting the mark on that. And then those will be subsequent conversations later too. Um, will and then Patrice, Will, go ahead. It's kind of an offshoot about socioeconomic analyses. So I think we'll, I'll, I'll save mine until later. Thanks, thanks Will. Patrice? Um, maybe I missed this, but um, are we defining our goal for offshore wind within the renewable energy portfolio? Is there a way to kind of grab our hands around what the potential build out for this is going to be for which all of those other pieces are trying to support or are we still sort of flying blind <laughs> in terms of you know how much offshore wind is enough um I, I i feel like that's just a really big piece that's missing and i i apologize if that was in the slide but it didn't click in my brain stephanie they're great oops dan go ahead please that's a really it's a really good question Patrice and I think the we have uh, funding to bring on a consultant to help us do some of that uh, modeling and analysis work um, you know obviously there's some uh, to target in statute for for 2030 but I think you know need to look at kind of um, you know how things fit within the energy space our office did an RPS study as you know which did show some opportunity for offshore wind but we're hoping to kind of take that um, and, and build upon that to figure out you know what some potential markers could be for the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years for offshore. And so I think it's a really important question to gauge. So is that you know, sort of a where parallel are we going? project to this? Uh, so, so how do those two pieces fit together? Yeah, sorry. So I, there is funding to uh, bring on a consultant to help us do some of that work as a part of this process. Great. Yeah, and, and you'll see later on, Patrice, when we talk about the, the energy markets and strategy working group, these kinds of questions are part of that. Yeah, and I, can I just note, David, too, that um, we have an active RFP as of today, Patrice, on the state procurement website for that study. So, um, you know, I, we welcome you to take a look at that and, um, you know, continue conversations about that moving forward. Yeah, I, I'll definitely do that. And for those of you out there who actually know this topic a lot better than I do, you know, the report that was done for the state of Maine, I mean, it just felt like a boilerplate that I read very similar reports that were done for other states, and it didn't really seem to speak and address the sorts of issues that we need to overcome here in the state. So and I really hope that we can take an actual step forward rather than more theoretical modeling, which could be anything. Um, so I, I will read that, but I really don't know what I'm talking about. So hopefully somebody else could maybe give better input on that. Thanks, Patrice. So I'm, I'm going to grab the other hands in just a sec. I'm putting in the chat a question and I welcome uh, advisory committee members to think about it and put a question if you want to use the chat as a way. Um, when you do chat, make sure you're um, chatting all panelists and attendees. That way everybody who's observing can see what's being said as well. But my question in the chat for you is what, what is your number one question about what this roadmap really is? What is this thing we're creating together? Um, Wing, go ahead, your hand is raised. Please use the chat folks if you want to, to answer that question. Wing, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to build from um, what Tom was talking about earlier with the uh, sort of data needs side and um, <clears throat> just um, sort of underscore the I think potential and real need for some interim um, and early recommendations that may not be waiting for the end of this process. Because I think for um, uh, some of us, there's, and I can see this sort of rapidly coming out of the um, environment and wildlife group, some very quick recommendations that I think we've already sort of explored a bit with the research array on lack of um, baseline data to help support decision-making. 
And in collecting baseline data, um, usually at a minimum, you at least need a couple of years to do so. And so I, so I think that's just something um, that's on my mind is not waiting to the end for some recommendations and that there may be some very quick things that um, are on some, uh, on some levels are low hanging fruit or just um, very obvious things that we need to um, start working on as soon as we can to really help position Maine to be in a good place to make uh, good decisions. Um, as um, I'm sure most of you know, there's been a lot of um, baseline data collection done to the south of us that we just don't have here in the Gulf of Maine. And it puts us a bit of a deficit when we start um, uh, considering um, how to move forward with environmentally responsible offshore wind. So just sort of just a comment underscore the importance of maybe some early recommendations um, that are actionable. Great. And Tom, before I go back to you, I just want to check with Don. Are you, do you have something very similar to what Wing was saying about data? Was that what your hand's about? No. Okay. Tom, let's go to you first. Tom, go ahead, please. Yeah, just like, first I was going to take a shot at, at, at answering in sort of very preliminary fashion Patrice's question because it, because Patrice's question suggested that maybe this effort was only looking at how Maine should fulfill its own portfolio requirements. And I think the certainly from an energy perspective and environmental perspective and, and an economic perspective, this process doesn't make sense unless we can sell a lot of it to people outside of Maine. Maine's particular needs are tiny compared to the overall need and frankly, compared to the resource. So I think it, it may be a good thing to start thinking about and that you know, this, is a, this is a project with at least regional and perhaps broader implications and opportunities. Um, and I just a quick shot at what I hope to come out of the process. It gets a little bit of the recommendations. I, I certainly hope that by the end of this process, sort of end of 2022, someone could take what this group recommends and actually do something other than do more studies. You know, actually perhaps pass legislation, perhaps start building something. Um, but candidly, I'd be disappointed if all of this study came out was with was you know this is an interesting idea and let's look at a few particular additional items and i think that's going to put a significant data burden on somebody here um because you know clearly one could study something forever but at that point we really will get left behind thanks tom absolutely taken to heart there um john go ahead um yeah so um I was going to underscore the point Tom just made about because the, the way I heard Celine's Celine's um, comment about kind of the, the geography of this was focused on Maine um, Maine's consumption and and renewable goals and this really is a, a a regional you know kind of New York to maritime scale uh, and Quebec scale question from a both an economic an energy economics and supply and load balancing uh, point of view. In the same in the same spirit of, to, of Wing's comment about there's some early habitat and and wildlife data information we need access to. I think similarly, it's it's going to be really important for this group to to hear an early overview of the the kind of regional energy economics and transmission economics issues because you know ultimately. Um, we're physics. Physics is a constraint, and economics is a constraint. And we we really need to understand and be the, the that economic and physics context for this work to to make recommendations that are are um, competent uh, and 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 smart in the context of those issues. So um, I'd be happy to follow up with whoever on that after this meeting, but, but we, we need to be learning about that as a group very early on. Don, can I get you to say just two more words about when you talk about physics and economics, what are you talking about there just in well, your head? We're competing, you know, we're competing with, uh, you know, a transmission backbone um, that, that has had, a, has, you know, has a running head start in terms of investment in the, in the mid Atlantic. Um, you know, we're, we're, um, so, you know, 
the, you know, how, how, what's the current view of transmission backbone in the Gulf of Maine um, and, and the economics of that? Um, you know, the, 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 the cost of del delivering energy in the, in the, you know, the, the, the large urban market where probably our markets where probably our energy will be consumed. Um, you know, we need to understand whether we can deliver that energy uh, competitively with projects in the, you know, in the South Atlantic. And I, I don't, I haven't seen that, that perspective outlined recently. Got it. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Admiral, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to affirm the point that uh, Tom made that there's federal waters. And again, uh, we can't control what goes on there. And so it's, again, it's going to happen. But also, as Don points out, we got to have the science and physics behind it because transmission of that power to the markets is a, is a critical issue. And uh, there's a lot of work that's got to be done. So that affirms, I think, the point that everybody has made along the way of these recommendations have to have science and quantitative data behind them. And I think that as uh, Stephanie and Dan and everybody else has pointed out, I think we have uh, the resources and capacity attached to this effort uh, that will provide that. Thank you. That's great. So we can go to a break early if, if we want to, because what will happen after a break is we're going to do a double click on the process and on the working group content, which will help answer a little bit more of these questions that we're working on right now. But before we do that, I wonder if there's any additional reflection on, you know, like that question I put in the chat, like what really is your number one, you know, doubt about what this thing is or what it is? And, um, we can work on that for a second more here, or we can pivot into a break, but I'll just open it up. Any more thoughts about that? Right. Terry, thanks for the, the point in the chat there where you're saying, you know, can we ensure coexistence with all historical stakeholders that are currently using the resource in the Gulf of Maine, right? And that have been sustainable for hundreds of years, right? Um, and, and the point about how do we ensure that small communities that depend on those historic stakeholders exist under the new economy um, based on or with offshore wind. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else before we, we go to a break, anything on this sort of overall picture of what the roadmap is or could be? Okay, Stephanie, is there anything you'd wanna clear up before we, we, we hit a break? Um, no, I think we're good. I'll just include in the chat um, later some of the links that we were referencing before. Great, great. And I will say on the issue of is this regional or is this main, it, it seems if I'm hearing folks correctly that the, the area of analysis has to be this bigger market, bigger region, bigger effort, right? And the Gulf of Maine is not Maine's per se, right? <laughs> However, the reason we're convened here in the state of Maine is we want to make sure that this is done in a way that supports Maine's interests, right? So that's why we have a main focus about what are our interests here and how do we embed those into the roadmap that Maine takes uh, in something that's inherently regional. So uh, I see Dan and Meredith perhaps want to improve that statement for what I just said. So go ahead. Uh, um, Dan, I, well, your hand just dropped off. Meredith, go ahead. Thanks. I, I guess I just wanted to kind of um, add to that framing a little bit. I think in terms of uh, this is a conversation that I think we've had in the fishing community quite a bit about um, how we not only you know protect existing uses, but how can we um, think about how do we posture Maine to protect those interests based on an understanding that is realistic about what might happen in terms of development in the Gulf of Maine. And so I think some of the questions that are coming out around that are really about trying to understand what it would take, what full build out might look like so that we can be responsive to that. And maybe that's a question that can't be answered, but I think knowing whether we can answer it or not is sort of a threshold for understanding 
how you effectively mitigate impacts to some of the existing uses. So, you know, again, maybe we can't get there, but it would be helpful to understand even what the constraints are to understanding that build out potential. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah. Steve? Um, I, I want to just from the supply chain's perspective and from main industry perspective that participate in offshore wind, for us, it's, it's a state issue, it's a regional issue, it's a New England issue, it's a national issue. Um, it doesn't bother me if technology developed at the University of Maine is installed in California. I think that's a good thing. And I, and I, I remind the state that, that we did this 10, 11 years ago. We have a bunch of companies and, and that have participated in offshore energy development in the US and around the world. And, and the more we can, we can use, if you do a research array, to, to hone our skills and promote our skills, it's important for this economy. So I, I, I again, I'm leaning toward regional. Yeah. Great. Okay. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a 10 minute break or a little more than 10 minute break? We'll be back at 1055 and we will look a little bit more uh, with a little more detail how this thing's going to be built, Laura will help us have that conversation and the co-chairs are going to speak just briefly to, to what they think these uh, working groups are really going to dig into and the product that they'll produce. So let's take, um, you know, 12 minutes or so on a break. We'll be back 10.55. Feel free to shut off your camera. We'll see you in, in 10 minutes and we'll pick it back up. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back 10.55. So we'll get going just a second as we, uh, as I see a few more cameras come back on. <clears throat> All right, great. Okay, we're back. Um, thanks everyone. So um, what's left for us to do today is look at this development process of how this actually might work. We're gonna hear from co-chairs right now uh, about deliverables. And I also wanna emphasize this, um, we really are eager for folks who are joining us um, to have you stay to the end. And there's gonna be this moment where we're gonna have this uh, opportunity for some consolidated input. Um, so we hope you stick with us and provide that input at the end of this meeting. Thank you for, for being here with us. Um, all right. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Laura uh, Singer, who's going to walk us through um, some of the, the details of what this process is going to look like. And then we'll hear from co-chairs. I'll put my screen back up. Um, Laura, uh, why don't you take it away and, and I'll advance slides as you need them. Sure. Thank you, David. And it's nice being here with you all and seeing some familiar faces. Um, you can go to the first slide, David. So we've seen this before. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that the design of the roadmap process brings together at the, the subject matter experts within the working groups um, who will discuss and deliberate ideas and that they will share those with um, up to the advisory committee for further um, discussion and consideration. A really important aspect of the committee structure is that the co-chairs from each of the working groups are also members of the advisory committee, you all. So there is that deliberate link um, that will allow for each of the working groups to have a touch point and a sense of what work is taking place across the whole roadmap effort. And co-chairs will also work to identify where there's cross-pollination that needs to take place um, between or among um, the different working groups because there are areas that might need that kind of um, uh, cross-pollination and linkages. Dan has already shared this overview timeline uh, for the roadmap, but what I really wanted to do is emphasize that we see the work happening in four distinct stages with multiple opportunities for public engagement throughout. 
So the first stage is the development of these original initial recommendations by the working groups. That'll really happen over the next six months. Um, so an intense work by the working groups. The advisory committee will have a check-in in October, but again, the bulk of the work will be taking place at the working group level. To provide some recommendations um, by December, and as was noted earlier, that might be an opportunity for some early recommendations to things that might um, need action even before the full roadmap is um, completed at the end of 2022. So those initial recommendations um, will we'll have an opportunity then to put those out for broader public um, input and people have a sense of where the working groups are going and be able to provide um, feedback um, to help uh, those recommendations improve and provide that feedback to the working groups. So um, after that, the roadmap content will be consolidated across the working groups and the uh, advisory council will work to finalize the content There'll be a second big push for feedback in that third phase with the final phase sharing the roadmap broadly to begin future work on implementation. So these, there are three specific moments when we'll proactively be seeking stakeholder input as well as ongoing ways for people to be involved in the process. And as was mentioned, there is a new um, website that will be launched uh, hopefully momentarily where people will be able to access content and um, provide links to provide input as well throughout the process. So that will be updated throughout the process. So there's early next year when we'll have the initial draft recommendations from the working groups. Then the late summer, early fall, when we'll have a consolidated roadmap um, across all working groups. And then finally, once the final roadmap is ready for implementation um, opportunities for people to see and to provide um, input on implementation. So as described in the previous slide, the um, advisory committee and the working groups will have a thoughtful workflow over the next 18 months with the advisory committee having oversight of the overall roadmap development, including refining the scope and public engagement as needed. Um, so this is all up for discussion about exactly how and making sure we do that um, as a group. And then um, drafting the, the final recommendations that will be developed by the working groups that um, brought forward to the advisory committee through deliberate points in the process. There is crossover between the advisory committee and working groups as we move forward. So the advisory group um, as Stephanie has described is a high level strategic oversight um, and is providing guidance to GEO on the four working groups to do their work. It, um, you'll assure hopefully alignment between and among the working groups and identify important issues that may not be getting attention and need further dialogue or focus. If needed, there could be an opportunity for us to have a subgroup that focuses and bears down in particular issues. Um, we also expect the advisory committee will be guiding the equity considerations within the working groups and making sure to integrate an equity lens as part of the final roadmap. And an important part of the advisory committee is to oversee GEO's public and stakeholder engagement efforts throughout the process and also support the working group's efforts to fully incorporate feedback in multiple ways. The advisory committee and working groups are advisory bodies and bringing expertise and dialogue and public engagement to GEO's development of a robust offshore wind roadmap for Maine. The committee and working groups will strive to reach consensus in their recommendations as we move forward. Um, that's defined by a broad uh, agreement among members where all or nearly all members can live with the proposed recommendations. Uh, David and I will be seeking as we facilitate to make sure there's discussion and uh, members can articulate and explore interests and concerns and creatively develop ideas and options if there are places where people are disagreeing and problem solve and needed. So we're not suggesting that all members will be equally satisfied with each and every recommendation, but we are hoping that um, consensus will indicate that the slate of recommendations in total does advance the public's interest and well-being um, of the citizens of Maine and is the greatest uh, product we can produce. 
And if we can't reach consensus on certain specific issues, despite our efforts, we'll certainly um, note those different points of view and um, issues in the final recommendations. Great. So at this point, I think, unless there's another thing you'd like to mention now, Laura, I think this was where we were gonna to pivot to have some of the co-chairs uh, speak for a minute or two on their specific working group charges. Um, does that sound good, Laura? Should we pivot to that? That's correct. Great, okay. So what we're gonna do is go through the four working groups and I'll just ask one of the co-chairs uh, to speak to this. We have a slide on each. Some of them require two slides just because the, the amount of content. Um, and it's fine. We have time today to spend, you know, up to two minutes or so on each one, but we can't do 10 minutes on each one. So let's, let's aim for like the two minute mark of, of sharing this. Um, and we'll start with uh, this one, which is uh, the supply chain workforce development ports and marine transportation working group. And there, because it's, it covers a breadth of issues, there's three co-chairs on that. And I will ask uh, some combination of Matt or Jonathan, if you just want to walk through what you understand your scope and deliverables are um, in this work. Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, uh, again, I'm, I'm Matt Burns with the main DOT and uh, I'm one of the co-chairs for the supply chain workforce development and uh, ports and marine transportation working group. And uh, my other uh, two co-chairs that I'll be working with are uh, Jonathan Poole from, from DECD and Steve Von Vogt from the Maine Composites Alliance. And uh, basically the, the scope or our, our charge for this working group is um, to examine you know, opportunities and needs to support offshore wind economy for Maine in those three areas. So obviously there's a, a great deal of uh, investigation into existing and potential supply chains. Uh, workforce development's a huge issue. I, I know we've touched on it a little bit in this meeting, um, just about the, the different yeah. and various jobs related to offshore wind energy that we'll need to you know, have a, at least some sort of a plan for here in the state uh, if we're looking to bring that to Maine. And then of course, ports and marine transportation, obviously with, with offshore wind, um, you, don't, you don't really have offshore wind unless you have uh, a robust ports network um, and a you know, central hub located somewhere you know, close to where the array is gonna be. So um, those are the things that we'll be exploring, I think as far as deliverables, um, you know, I mean, it, it articulates that pretty well, I think here in the bullets, but um, mm -hmm. you know, assessments for, for Maine's assets, I mean, that's, that's one of our uh, big goals is gonna be to you know, create a catalog of, of port assets and also you know, supply chain and workforce development, of course, as well, uh, guidance on socioeconomic data, um, standards and requirements for developers you know, that are gonna be looking to, to have projects here in Maine or in the region. Um, and you know, coming up with with criteria, especially with regards to uh, port infrastructure, um, and then you know, list of prioritized information and, and gap filling. I think is going to be important to uh, be able to provide the advisory committee with, and then ultimately a report that we'll be generating with our recommendations to the advisory committee when our work's done. So I think that uh, that that covers it pretty well. Thanks, Matt. Sure. Great. Um, Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, just by the way, I'm hearing some noise in the background. I don't know if that's someone unmuted, but uh, please go ahead and mute yourself if you haven't. Okay, so that's what the supply chain workforce development ports and marine transportation working groups are doing. And I'm having also Patrice's uh, comment in my head of like getting real. And I think this is the essence of actually getting down into the reality uh, and, uh, and what it really means and what it would take to do this well. Let's do the next one, um, <clears throat> which is Energy Strategy and Markets Working Group. And there, Selena will be co-chairing with Jeremy Payne. Um, and so, Selena, if you want to speak to what you see the scope and deliverables are for this group. Sure. So this group will uh, focus on a number of key components of the roadmap, um, and, and those are from an energy, uh, offshore wind energy targets that we've talked about earlier today, um, and consideration of both Maine's needs, but also within the regional 
uh, sense of what, what's, what's coming down in uh, the pike there. Uh, what is the state of the offshore wind um, industry and where are there opportunities? And then importantly, the economic, socioeconomic um, costs and benefits of offshore wind. Um, this is, we, we've put some thought into how to do this. We'll definitely want feedback and conversation with various working groups and how we appropriately capture that. Um, as it was noted that that can go in a variety of different directions, how big we go in terms of the, um, the types of impacts that we'll be measuring there. Um, we wanna make sure that we have a, a, a economic um, impact assessment that we all feel good about and captures quantitatively where we can and qualitatively where we cannot. Uh, we'll also be looking at interconnection and transmission. And this includes both from an onshore standpoint, whether it be the regional grid um, and other uh, transmission constraints we have and how offshore wind can or cannot fit within that. And then on the offshore side, so um, both from a regional standpoint and then a national standpoint, there's been looking, we people have been looking into how best to interconnect uh, multiple offshore wind projects to um, be more efficient in transmission and also minimize impacts. So um, again, the, these are uh, draft recommendations that we will, in certain instances, want to work with other working groups, given that this working group is primarily focused with people with expertise on energy, but these topics do cross into other working group um, topics and, and expertise. And lastly, we want to make sure that we fully capture the opportunities such as storage and other ways that we might consider other technologies integrating with offshore wind. Um, and from an R&D standpoint, um, where are there future opportunities for uh, leadership in, in Maine? So as mentioned, we've put forward an RFP to help us do some of this work. I will go through um, getting someone under contract over the next uh, couple of months and can fine tune the, the focus of that to meet the needs of the advisory committee and the working group. Okay. All right, so a lot going on there. Um, let's do one, uh, let's do the other two and then we'll have some time because I think this is something we're going to want to dig into and have some discussion around. Um, Fisheries Working Group co-chaired by Meredith and Terry. Um, I'll leave it, Meredith, if you want to kick off uh, about what the scope and deliverables uh, you expect will be um, uh, for these, for this working group. Sure, thanks, David. Um, so first, I just also want to thank Terry for stepping up to co-chair this with me. I've been lucky to have uh, other committee work with him in other settings, and Terry is a really great co-chair. So this is going to be a, a challenging conversation, as we know. Um, so thinking about the scope um, and also recognizing that we haven't met yet, and I think some of these priorities could be um, kind of evolving as we meet and get a sense of where the working group wants to focus. Um, overall focusing on the potential impacts of offshore wind that they might have on not just the marine resources, but also the activities around them, um, which we are anticipating will be mostly around wild harvest fisheries for the time being, since we're thinking about federal waters, um, and thinking about ways that we can really tangi create tangible, um, you know, discrete ways that we could not just um, mitigate impacts, but also try to avoid them or minimize them in the first place to fishing activity. Um, what other data needs do we have? Where do we uh, need to fill information gaps? I think that'll be a really critical question for this group as well, because we do struggle with some key information needs in this area related to fishing activity for certain um, key fisheries like the lobster fishery in particular in Maine. Um, and so on the deliverable side, again, I, um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to come up with some really clear recommendations of um, criteria or standards that could be incorporated into policy to help um, address some siting challenges related to fishing activity um, to minimize or avoid impacts to that activity. Um, other ways that we might implement those kinds of recommendations and then also identify priority monitoring and research. Um, both for broad needs as well as things that might be accomplished through the research array. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, so also um, thinking about, as I said, recommendations that we might bring to um, the State Research Consortium from this group for uh, research priorities, 
as, and also I think also for baseline data needs um, as we're thinking about the next couple of years prior to um, construction of that project should be permitted. Um, thinking about ways that we can recommend engagement with the fishing industry from the developer side. Um, I think there are some, some real lessons to be learned there from Southern New England, especially, um, and opportunities to improve. Um, what additional socioeconomic data do we need? We've certainly seen some, um, some lacking data on that side um, as we've developed the research array guidance and we need to work on how we improve that. Um, and um, so we'll be pulling all of that together um, and making rec those recommendations to the advisory committee as well. Great, thanks Meredith. Um, okay, let's do the last one, uh, <clears throat> which is the Environment and Wildlife Working Group. Um, and there we have John Perry uh, and Wing and John is, is just stepping into this role. And, uh, and John, I'll turn it over to you, but feel free to share this with Wing um, as you walk through. And there's a second page to this with a few more, a few more bullets as well. No, I appreciate that, David. It is a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, but uh, I think though, from both mine and Wing's perspectives, uh, we're both very hopeful that we'll be able to hit the ground running with our environment and wildlife working group. It, it seems that there are some ongoing efforts from the East Coast and overseas that we'll be able to draw from to help us in this process. Uh, you know, as, as Wing mentioned earlier, I'm also hopeful we could implement some early recommendations right out of the gate, at least from, from my experience and my perspective, having been involved in reviewing around a dozen or so onshore wind power projects. It, uh, it seems at least some of the impact avoidance, minimization and mitigation strategies from onshore wind projects can in, in principle at least um, be applied to avoidance, minimization and mitigation best practices at offshore wind and, and help inform us and, and lead us in developing environmentally responsible wind power in the Gulf of Maine. So uh, for example, we, we know we have bats offshore. All, all of eight species of bats in Maine are either considered rare, threatened or endangered. So similar to onshore wind power projects in all likelihood some form of seasonal curtailment strategy either a blanket curtailment or smart curtailment can conceivably be utilized to protect main species of bats but but obviously we're talking about the offshore marine environment and marine wildlife and excuse me there are many unknowns out there in the marine environment um, my understanding is that part of this process will be identifying research and developing monitoring opportunities so so for example, on the subject of bats, are bats actively foraging out to sea, or are they simply just passing through, or, or bats attack, attracted to turbines out to sea? There's some evidence that bats might see turbines as the tallest tree in the woods at onshore projects. Is this the case for offshore turbines? You know, it's, questions like these need to be addressed. Um, so, you know, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife certainly appreciates having a seat at the table for this roadmap process, but we simply do not have the in-house expertise to examine potential impacts to marine mammals and the marine environment. And this is where those of you on the Environment and Wildlife Working Group with, with marine life and marine habitat expertise will be absolutely critical in asking the right questions, identifying data gaps, uh, working through any issues, developing needed research scenarios, and, and ultimately developing best management uh, uh, excuse me, best practice strategies and an action plan to help us inform the advisory committee and, and hopefully guide environmentally responsible wind power development in the Gulf of Maine moving forward. And, and as this process moves forward, uh, we'll be working with the exist, within the existing applicable state and federal regulatory framework, but, but this is uncharted waters, no pun intended, but and conceivably we might get to a point where we may want to consider are there other policies or, or guidelines that we should that should be developed to help us advance this opportunity. So uh, these are the challenges that our working group are going to need to get a handle on and, and applying lessons learned from wind projects overseas, as well as the uh, you know ongoing collaboratives we've seen in places like New York State and elsewhere that uh, where we can apply to go. Gulf of Maine wind power. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled and fortunate to have Wing Goodale as my co-chair as we work through this process. His uh, experience and research with offshore wind and, and just wildlife in general will be absolutely invaluable. Uh, so with that, Wing, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I think you covered it really well. And I guess just um, one of the things I think about as we move forward is there has been, as John mentioned, a lot of work been done 
um, regionally um, around these issues. And I think we here in Maine actually have a real opportunity to build strongly from um, the work that's been done um, by NYSERDA's um, Environmental Technical Working Group, for example, and um, also the substantial work done um, and research done in Europe. So definitely be looking at ways to, um, you know, we can start sort of two thirds of the way down this road already, um, really working strongly from the existing efforts. Um, and also I think, and, and John mentioned this as well, is it will be important to consider recommendations within the context of um, state and federal regulations, um, uh, the Coastal Zone Management Act, for example, and how the state will interface with um, uh, federal agencies through that, um, as well as existing um, uh, guidance that um, is out there, say from BOEM on avian survey guidance and how, how can recommendations build from those other efforts. So uh, really looking forward to working with John and all those that are um, gonna be joining this group and thank you very much. Great, okay. Okay, um, that's great. And I, I think we're gonna wanna talk about this for a little bit. Before we do, we have just two more or two or three more things we wanted to mention about how the work will get done. I also, I welcome, uh, committee members to use the chat. When you do use the chat, please forward to panelists and attendees so everybody uh, who's observing can see as well. Um, if you're having a trouble doing that, just let me know. I'll also forward things like what I just did with Don's comment so that everybody can see them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So Laura, you have a, two more things or three more things you want to share with us about yeah, how the work's going to get done? Yep. Yeah. Um, just to give everyone a sense of the anticipated uh, meeting schedule for the advisory committee, we have three met, um, meetings scheduled for this year, basically on a, a, a quarterly basis. Um, we're planning on those meetings being approximately three hours each. Um, so we have this meeting in July, we have October and then December when we will receive some draft recommendations from the working groups. We're hoping um, that we'll be able to gather in person at some point. And if that happens, we may decide to extend the meetings um, to take adv advantage of the time we have together. In um, 2022, we'll have a meeting in the spring. Again, that will be after there's public input on those recommendations. Um, uh, final recommendations rolling in in June and then further conversations next fall before finalizing the roadmap. In between, we'll have some brief one hour check-ins on progress between those meetings. And I would suggest that we might be able to um, solicit from you all some suggestions of uh, content and background that you might not have because you're all coming from different places that might be useful or webinars we can point you to or, or host to allow people to learn in between um, the advisory committee meetings. Next slide. Um, oops. So where are my circles of engagement? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I'll skip to the next one. Um, all meetings will are op open to the public and will be noticed um, on main.gov. It's the public calendar and also on the new offshore wind website. Um, as advisory groups, we just wanted to let you know that you and the working groups fall under a provision of Maine's Freedom of Access Act that allows um, you to maintain your working papers as confidential, but unless they are shared in a meeting or distributed by a member. So things that are shared at a meeting are things that are um, open and um, available to all members of the public. In general, we're gonna seek to ensure that all materials are available online and um, we're working out some of the technical kinks right now actually to get some of the calendaring to work on our new website, but uh, people can expect that everything will be uploaded and available. Laura, I'll get you your circles of engagement. Just give me one second and we'll put these back up. Um, well, that's okay. I can speak to it even if, if we don't if we don't see it. Because um, I think it's important that again, with the, with the, um, the kind of engagement we're envisioning here, it is really sort of what David and I have called these circles of engagement. And we're really looking to the working groups to help shape um, and the advisory committee, but really a lot of the working groups to help shape appropriate and targeted engagement at those various pieces. 
so that um, we have targeted engagement with particular stakeholders, work groups um, in places um, on their turf that we can make sure we're getting feedback and then even broader public engagement, which will happen uh, most commonly probably electronically and some other larger stakeholder meetings. So I just wanted to note that uh, we're looking at the inner circle now and we will be continuing to expand that circle and make opportunities available and really look to members of the working group that have connections and linkages, um, both uh, the working group and advisory committee to, to help us in making sure we're doing that engagement effort um, satisfactorily. And then I think the last slide is about um, an important piece here, which is equity. It's an, an important lens of Maine's uh, climate work. And this process will also incorporate that lens into the core of what we do. There's expertise in this group around equity. Um, for instance, Suzanne uh, McDonald has been on the Climate Council's Equity Subcommittee and hopefully can um, provide us some, some insight from her experience. We'll speak about this a little bit more, but for now, just wanted to flag that we'll be working with you to develop some guiding questions for the working groups to look at this um, issue and focus on the impact and marginalized communities as we go forward. Understanding that the distributions and the, of the benefits and the burdens um, are important to look at and ensure we have an equitable approach in our participation as well. I didn't know, David, if there's anything you wanted to add to that, but I think that's the last slide. No, and I think we do need to do a deeper dive on this conversation in subsequent meetings and in the working group. So expect Laura and I and others to be uh, working with you and helping to find what equity looks like for our work in offshore wind. Okay, I think that's it. Um, uh, before we go to next steps, I actually would like to um, just take a breather on the content we just shared, in particular what the working group said, uh, chair said, and also the pieces that Laura said. If it's a lot of detail about sort of the ins and outs of the deliverables of the working groups, we'll probably need to save that for the first meeting of the working groups, or if you wanna have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with the co-chairs, we welcome that. But I think we're just trying to help everybody, including ourselves, get a sense of how this work is gonna get done and what the scope of the work is. We're asking all of us to do this. Um, okay. Uh, so just any questions, comments, reflections, now that you've had a little bit more detail on how the work's gonna get done and the scope. Suzanne? And then Dawn. Uh, thanks, great. Um, yeah, thanks for all of this detail. It's giving me a lot to think about. So I feel like I'm maybe responding to things from the last conversation because it's taken, um, the gears are turning. Um, to your question earlier, David, I, this sort of links to the presentation that just happened, but what's your number one question about the roadmap? For me, quite frankly, um, you know, it does relate to, I think, what, what Tom asked earlier around, are we going to produce something that is actionable? And is it something that we can stand by? For me, from where I sit, from the stakeholder engagement work and perspectives that I bring, we always say the outcome is only as good as the process that led to it. And so I know it's really the work of this group to help guide what the stakeholder engagement process is gonna look like for this particular piece of it. But I guess what I just wanna, so I know we don't, we can't answer this right now, but I guess what I would put out to the group is, is really, I think an interest in exploring both over the last 13 years of this work in Maine, what has worked well that we wanna make sure we're carrying forward into the roadmap process from an engagement perspective and what maybe hasn't served us so well that we want to make sure that we're not repeating and continuing to do or you know improving upon as as best we can. Um, part of that includes the question of you know the outcome is only as good as the process that led to it is who's at the table and I just um, would love any insights into the tribal representation question of of all of this I, from the survey results. Um, it doesn't look like we've got anybody on the line today but but maybe there's some perspective on that. And the last thing I just want to say, I um, appreciate the, the phrase, the exploration around benefits and burdens and what I hear is coming in the socio socioeconomic study, perhaps for the energy working group. Um, I think just a plus one to the regional approach to all of this. And, and I'm curious to understand through this process how we 
also weigh the sort of impacts to communities from outside of Maine that maybe is a part of this, um, maybe perhaps that are host to fossil fuel generation that perhaps will come offline as a result of some clean energy uh, coming onto the grid. How do we factor that into this is something I'd like to explore throughout this process as well. So sorry for uh, building it all up, but that's what's in my head right now. Thanks, thanks Suzanne. And before I go to Dawn and then Patrice, um, I don't know if uh, anyone from the Energy Governor's Energy Office wants to take pieces of that now uh, of some of the questions that Suzanne put out there or tuck those away for, yep, we need to get some answers to that. Are there any immediate reactions that folks from GEO want to say? Um, you know, I think they're all really, really well said and, and great points. So I want to think about them and make sure that we're considering them as we think about um, the work before us. On the tribal representative, I see another con just chat working to, uh, to to finalize that. So, um, just wanted to flag that. That's all. Re all really well said. Thanks. I'm going to go to Don first, who is waving at me, and then I'll go to Patrice. Don, go ahead, please. Um, yeah. So the, the the question I posted in the chat box, I, I I haven't heard a response to, and I think the spirit of my question is, you know, we we have a very high level overview, and ultimately. Um, approval of of this roadmap, and um, I, I think a key question is understanding what are the technical questions that the GEO and the working groups are have identified that need additional information, and what you know is there a is there a is there a working list of RFPs are going to go out to answer what questions on what timeline at what budget because the you know we can all sit around and talk in generalities about this stuff but uh, it has to be reduced to to actionable information and and uh, and filling critical gaps uh, information gaps so I don't know if you have that already um, or not but understanding the state of you know, kind of what's the state of the, the game here in terms of information needs that have been identified and how, how you all expect to get that through either paid work or through, you know, through voluntary advice to the working groups. Thanks, Don. I'm glad you brought that up. And I, you know, uh, I don't know if someone at, uh, at, at GEO, whether Selena or Stephanie or, or Dan want to speak to the the RFPs in the process for having additional technical work done during our 18 months of of work. Does someone want to just mention what the what the vision is there? Yeah, um, I can start maybe David and then if um, Dan or Selena went away in, that's that's great too. Um, we actually do have a slide, I think, way at the end of the deck about um, uh, just a kind of an overview of technical studies that we're thinking about for this process. Um, at, at this point, we've we've put out one public RFP on doing a supply chain and workforce opportunity assessment. So that went through the state uh, public RFP process. Um, and we have just awarded that this week uh, to the group that's listed there. Um, and we have not got to the contracting stage of that yet. That will be our next step. So that may be a good place for um, additional perspective from the advisory committee. Um, and then we also have an active RFP out as of today on the state procurement site to do an offshore wind industry, energy markets, transmission and socioeconomic analysis. Uh, so again, that's on an, an early part of the process, and we will be, um, you know, that's another opportunity in the contracting phase to, to help shape the data that comes from that. Um, and I, I just want to note, too, that we initiated these processes before the roadmap uh, advisory committee got going, just because it takes so long to get these through the state process and underway. And so if we had any hope of having the data from these studies, we had to at least get a couple of the RFPs into the pipeline 
but we still have lots of opportunity through the contracting process to, to shape the results of those studies and what we want to inform the roadmap and the advisory committee. Um, and DOT has also funded a main ports assessment. Um, Matt can speak to that if he would like to, that is ongoing. Um, and then we have some additional hope to do an assessment of existing ocean data and enhancements to that to um, potentially help us understand how to reduce impacts to other ocean uses. So again, that, that is still to be determined and I would hope that um, that you as part of the advisory committee and that fisheries working group and other working groups can help weigh in and shape what that future study will, will be. Great, super, thanks, Stephanie. Okay, um, Patrice. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to uh, comment on the beginning of the second session, which was the governance and decision-making um, process that you have for this committee. Um, that fills me with a lot of anxiety <laughs> um, that you're seeing this as a consensus-based um, approach. The fishing industry just doesn't share this vision for offshore wind, and we've been clear about that. So I'm really sort of grappling with, you know, what a consensus would mean. I I can wrap my head around our participation and making the best use of the planning time and having some accountability to have some of the hard questions asked and answered. But in terms of a product that would require consensus, I, I, I just want to flag that. And, you know, without any understanding of the scope of, of what this would be for Maine, um, I think a lot of people haven't understood that we are going to be a net, a net exporter of this energy. Um, these offshore wind developments come with significant habitat alteration, and we really don't understand for, particularly if we're going to do floating, what that's going to mean for our marine environment. So those, I mean, they simply can't be answered in the timeline that you've put forward. Um, so given that we are potentially losing jobs to provide renewable energy to Maine and elsewhere, um, I just want to flag <laughs> anything consensus-based could be a real stretch. Um, I want to participate. I think this process is important, but um, you know how we bring this together at the end. I think we just kind of need to leave some options open so that everybody's opinion can can move forward in a meaningful way. I'm glad you mentioned that, Patrice. And the way we think about when we talk about consensus here is it's a spirit of trying to figure out where we are aligned and really digging into the substance of it and working through those challenges and differences and seeing if there is a pathway in which we feel collectively okay about. Um, it's not, we all will have a unanimous agreement on everything at the end. And that's why when Laura talked about it earlier, um, if there are persistent different views out there about specific issues that a working group is working on, for instance, or this advisory committee. Um, this product from you all as an advisory committee, uh, which are the recommendations, um, can absolutely have different viewpoints in it. And then GEO is gonna have to figure out, the governor's energy office, figure out what to do with that. Um, so we're walking into this, we're putting out there the spirit of consensus in the spirit of sort of exploring where we could find areas of alignment and recognizing that we may or may not on every issue find that. And no, there's no like <clears throat> sort of obligation on the front end of like, oh yeah, I'm up for a consensus agreement walking into this. Absolutely not. So yeah, I, I guess I, I just want to be clear that I, I don't foresee any movement from the commercial fishing industry at large that they're going to change their minds that offshore wind is the best choice for Maine. Um, so it's it's just an awkward starting point for people in our sector to be participating. And it's just really important um, for my participation, and I'm sure other people from the commercial fishing industry are stepping up for the fisheries working group. Um, they, they, they just don't agree with this, but they understand the need to be at the table so that if it moves forward, it's done in the in the best way possible for me, but the 
<laughs> the scope of questions and the scale of what we're talking about and our lack of baseline information. I, I just don't see us being in any position to move outside of you know, this discomfort zone um, for a significant amount of time. So we're, we're just sort of couched in an awkward position because this is a pro offshore wind process and I don't see us getting to the end even meeting you at your starting point. So I just, I just want to be clear about that. But you know, we're here in good faith. We're here to improve this planning process and to really, I hope, help raise and shed some light on a lot of important unanswered questions. Thanks, Patrice. And I would welcome also, Patrice, if you want to circle back with me and Lauren and others about how to frame this up in a way that feels appropriate, we'd welcome that conversation. Yeah, and I'll say to Geo, you know, some of the initial language that we were given, we were uncomfortable with how it was being described, and they were very open to changing that. And, you know, those sorts of movements and willingness to listen have meant a lot to the fishing community and really had paved the way for us to continue to participate in this process. So I, I really do appreciate that. That's great. Thanks, Patrice. Tom, you have your hand up? As a follow up on Patrice's comment. Um, I don't think there is a this yet. <laughs> I mean, there isn't there. I, I think part of the, the part of this effort is to figure out whether there is something that is worth proposing that makes economic environmental job sense. And that in, in a sense, the, the objective as I understand it is let's, let's see what the best possible option is in the context of exploring deep water offshore wind. And then the second question is, okay, does that make sense? I mean, does it actually fulfill positive economic and environmental objectives? And then there's a third decision that comes along that the GEO and political entities are gonna to have to make is whether in light of that kind of information, do you go ahead and do something? And, and if so, what is that particular thing to do? So. I guess I'm a little uncomfortable, Patrice, with, with, you, with your view that it, it seems to be that you don't think there's a this that, that the fishing industry could possibly support. And I would suggest that maybe the industry ought to keep an open mind on that because it's not clear what the this is at this point. So I, I think I would love to sort of open up some space for some public comment in just a moment because I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, and I think these are really fundamental questions we're getting at with, with Tom and Patrice. And these are what will carry forward into the way the working groups, uh, working groups function. One thing we wanted to do um, just to sort of make sure we're lifting up all 20 something voices of you is we have a little tool where we want to use and Maggie, my colleague is going to throw a link just in uh, just a panelist in the chat. Um, and if you click on what she just sent into panelists and folks, members of the public, we're going to do the same thing with you with these same questions in just one second. Um, but for members of the advisory committee, if you click on that link that is from Maggie right now in the chat, it will take you to a question. Um, and that question is, what about this roadmap process makes me most hopeful? And you can anticipate, there's a second question when we're done with this about what concerns me, but we're gonna start with the hopes first. And so if you can just take up 30 seconds to think for a second, what really makes me hopeful um, about this process right now? Save the concerns for the next question, we're about to do that, um, and then write it in there but do a little thinking first. And then when Maggie starts to see a bunch of responses, she's gonna share her screen um, and you'll see what your fellow committee members are writing. So just take a minute with this question. If anybody's having a hard time making that link work, shout out and let me know, but click through it. Short answers are best so we can read them easily together. But what makes you hopeful? I'll give you a minute to think.
All right, Maggie, if you're seeing some responses, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? David, are you not seeing my screen now? Oops, sorry. It's, I've got multiple things going on here. You can see your screen, Maggie. Excellent. Thank you. Great. So if you've already written something, take a moment and see what your fellow committee members are saying about their hopes here. Maggie, I don't know if you can um, scroll down slowly or expand it some way so everyone can see. Yeah. Yep, I'll just um, scroll through here. Thanks. So I'm just letting folks read. I don't want to get in your head while you read. Okay, so clearly common themes around a diverse group coming together looks like a good process, right? Those are the kinds of themes I'm seeing in what you've written. Okay, let's pivot to the next question. We're gonna keep this and we'll send this out to you as part of the meeting summary. So if you, uh, Maggie, if they click on the same link now, they can get to the next question about the concerns, right? Yep. Um you don't even need to click on it. If you just go back to that window, it should prompt you to move forward. Yeah, it says go to the next slide. Go ahead and click on that, go to the next slide. <clears throat> and it says, what most concerns me today in, about this process, right? Maggie or David, can you share your screen so we can see how things are popping up? Yep, I'm just waiting for one or two to come in. Okay. If anybody's having trouble getting to this, let us know. Again, I'll let you just read. Again, I'm just letting everybody read. Okay. All right. So you're seeing some of those concerns out there, right? Concerns about how are we walking into this process right, about the time we have, about the data we have, about the way we're gonna be working together, right? We're working on a controversial issue, we know that, and it's gonna be challenging. So absolutely, these are gonna be some, some of the issues we're working on. Okay, this is what I'd love to do. Um, I'd love to spend the next 10 minutes or so doing this with the public that have joined us. And the way we're gonna do it is Maggie's gonna put in a very similar link um, just to um, members of the public, the attendees, attendees here on our Zoom webinar. And we're gonna combine the two questions into one thing. You can do it at your own pace. 
So if you're still joining us as a member of the public or observer in this meeting, um, click on that link. Again, if you're an advisory committee member, don't use it now, you've already done it. Um, click on that if you are a member of the public. And please just write something shorter, the better. You've seen how we're sharing it. So it's much easier to share if it's a short, a short blurb. And uh, we're asking you to put your name to it as well. Uh, this is not sort of an anonymous moment here. Um, it's, uh, it's let us know what you're thinking. And please write something that is, uh, you know, worthy of sharing in a public forum. Um, <clears throat> so we'll wait a second here and get some of those in. Um, and in fact, while we are waiting for the public uh, to write some of that up and get some of that content going, we can talk a little bit about next steps. In fact, we'll accelerate that just to, um, uh, while folks, members of the public are, are writing in those comments. Um, so Dan, we actually have a slide here on next steps that you might wanna just say a word to, I'll put it up on the screen while we're waiting for some content to come in. <clears throat> just give me one second and I'll share my screen with that. Yeah, I have to. I think it's just a picture of a couple of two birds. So I think yes, yeah, so maybe awesome. it's not crucial. Yes, um, it's a great picture, but uh, not crucial to my remarks about next steps. Yes. Um, so first, just really appreciate everyone uh, again spending the time for this kickoff. Got a lot of really good feedback. I think you know necessarily we needed to keep this kind of a, at a launch frame, but you can already see the 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 path that we're going to need to go down through the different working groups and, and otherwise. So I think it was a really good start to a, a really important process. So um, I think I can speak for, for Grog and, and the entire team by saying thank you to everyone that participated this morning. Um, all of our materials from today and going forward will be posted online at mainoffshorewind.org. That uh, is being um, uh, launched um, any minute. We're going through a few technical issues on, on, on that right now, but that will be posted today. Um, we have uh, provided um, approach documents that are more, more detailed uh, multi-page documents about the approach of the advisory council, but also the approach of the working groups that are draft. Um, and we are looking for feedback on those. Um, so uh, we can, we'll follow up in the email around making sure that everyone has it and, and the, the timing of that feedback, but we're looking to kind of take what we've done today take the approach documents that you've been sent and, and finalize them just to make sure we're all on the same page about where we're going. Working groups will begin meeting over the next month or so. Uh, and those, those meetings will be posted again, again online, but we'll be taking those, um, uh, you know, kind of some of the more detailed questions and things that we've talked about and begin to start working through them. And then this group will, will re reconvene in October. Um, I believe we have October 6th set as a tentative date. Um, and so we'll follow up with all these things in, in email and in writing. So it's really clear about what the next steps and what the asks are. Um, but uh, we are uh, excited to get this going and feel like today was a, a really good start to this process. So those are the next steps. Thanks, Dan. Great. Um, let's just as a quick, is there other questions about the next steps and what to expect in the coming months as the working groups start to get going and in this, this work really, we dive in. Are there any questions about next steps before we share what we're seeing in the public comment? Grog, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, jump onto what Dan said and urge everybody to keep an open mind and approach this not from a zero sum uh, uh, mindset, but from uh, a learning mindset. I believe that it's a huge resource out there we're gonna do everything in our power to make sure that all decisions we make are made based on hard science, hard data, uh, and that we do end up with actual deliverables. And that uh, I am absolutely certain that, uh, that we are gonna be able to find a way that uh, it isn't zero sum. And in reality, uh, there are going to be ways, uh, science-based ways that we can all support our various uh, interests that we have in this project. So I just urge everybody to keep an open mind, keep the transparency. I was deeply impressed by the level of trust and uh, openness that was expressed by everybody this morning. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you as we proceed on this project that is gonna be crucially important to the future economic well-being of our state. Thanks Admiral, that's great. 
So let's look at see what folks are sending, saying from the public, um, spend a little time with that, and then we'll conclude more towards the top of the hour. But I, I wonder, Maggie, if you're seeing results from what folks, let's look at the hopeful ones first, and then we'll look at the concerns. Um, let's just read ourselves again and look at the screen. Everyone should be able to read that. The, the fonts looks pretty good. So certainly when I read this, I'm seeing the hopefulness around the diversity of you all, right? The, the stakeholder driven aspect of the process um, and the opportunities of not reinventing the wheel and, and the content that's already out there. So those all seem hopeful. Have to recognize that some people are not feeling hopeful. That's okay too, right? Uh, that's a reality of this and it's important that that gets expressed. But those are certainly some of the big themes I'm hearing. Um, Maggie, do you want to switch to the other one? Okay, let's read a little bit about the concerns that folks who are listening in want to tell us. Great. So you can see there, right? You can see this, this sort of tension around our voices really being included, our voices acting in good faith. You know, what, what are those tensions? Um, also, do we have the right expertise around this table and other tables? Um, there's clearly some concerns there that can be addressed uh, with, with knowledge and, uh, and, and some answers that can be provided and that there's these core concerns that are there that are gonna be part of the context of our work, right? The context of how we're going about our work will be kind of concerns that we're seeing on this. Before we close up, I'll just open it up again to our advisory committee here to say, when you look at what you said and what the public or the, your observers said about hopes, and when you look at what you said and what the public said around concerns, you know, we, we don't have time right now to open up a whole debate on something. But if there's something you really feel like it's important to say about the context of our work together, we can, we can have a minute or two right now before we finish up. So I'll just say, if there's anything the way I've expressed the summary of what we just saw that could be improved, I'd welcome that right now. Great. Excellent. So Dan laid out next steps. Um, we won't have a meeting like this. Perhaps our October meeting will be in person. Let's see. Um, but we won't be back together until October. Uh, there may be some uh, phone call check-ins, as Laura mentioned. We'll let you know uh, if we need to get together for 
30 or 60 minutes to do some updates and some key issues. Um, we'll give you some advance notice if that needs to happen. Otherwise, I'll pile on with the thanks from Dan um, and, and Grog about people's willingness to engage um, and to talk and to really lay it out there and knowing that it is difficult um, and it, it is a, a challenging issue that we've taken on. And thank you for your willingness to engage in this way. Um, with that, let's finish up today, unless Dan um, or, or, or Grog, there's anything else you'd like to put on the table before we finish up. Um, and so I'll just say, Dan, last, any last words from you? No, I, just that we got a few questions before and then now one about an in-person meeting. You know, I think we hope to be able to do, do that at some point. So I uh, hope to see everyone in person. Uh, but again, really appreciate everyone's, everyone's participation and have a great rest of the day. Absolutely. The website, sadly, is not live at this moment, but in literally minutes or an hour or two, we'll be ready. And when it is, we'll make sure it's out. If you are not part of the mailing list uh, to receive information on offshore wind, please go to the governor's uh, energy office website and sign up on the mailing list there. And that is a good way to stay informed. Um, as we've mentioned, all meetings will be noticed publicly. Um, and so there's multiple ways to get engaged in this. Uh, we also will be uh, sharing within a week or so the, the participants in the working groups, those names of folks who will be participating. So uh, stand by for that and you'll get those names shortly. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.